Good morning. We are going to start five minutes early. So thank you all for showing up and promptly. Um, I believe the first item, we do need to do a roll call. I know Commissioner Holton will be joining us shortly. Chair Benton. Here. Commissioner Boygan. Commissioner Holton. Commissioner Agar. Here. Commissioner Hawkins. Here. Commissioner Jolly. Here. Commissioner McGowan. Here. Commissioner Overture. Here. Commissioner Randall. I have six of nine, Mr. Chair. Okay, so we have a quorum. Any procedural things we need to take care of before we get started with our first item? Not that I'm aware of, Mr. Chair. Okay. Mr. Davenport? All right. So our first item, I'll, since Ms. Prine is passing out something, it's docket. I believe these are both combined, right? Docket numbers 18400360 and 18070536. Price of Energy and Kerr McGee. Uh, I believe it characterizes competitive spacing units. And we'll turn it over to the hearing officer for an explanation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Um, <clears throat> This hearing combines two applications, if you have noticed, and it involves two competing, that is, overlapping spacing applications for the same lands. Basically, RESA wants a laydown unit that includes Section 35, Township 1 North, Range 66 West, while Kermagee wants a stand-up unit that includes the same Section 35. You will need to evaluate the evidence and arguments as to why one party's application should be approved instead of the other party's competing application. The parties have stipulated to certain facts regarding procedural history, land, and geology. These stipulations should be treated as undisputed proven facts and incorporated into your findings of fact. Kerr McGee filed a motion in limine to exclude duplicative of RESA witnesses. Uh, RESA has endorsed uh, multiple geological witnesses, engineering witnesses, land witnesses, etc. cetera. Uh, that motion was denied by the hearing officer while RESA has endorsed multiple witness, witnesses, it has the allotted time to present its case with whatever witnesses it chooses to use. Each party will have 60 minutes for its case, including opening argument, case in chief, cross-examination, rebuttal, and closing arguments. These times are exclusive of commissioners' questions and answers to those questions. The order of presentation is set out in the final pre-hearing order. Their choices for ruling appear to be to approve the RESA application and deny the Kerr-McGee application, or on the other hand, to approve the Kerr-McGee application and deny the RESA application. Okay, thank you very much. I do need to check to see if, are there any potential conflicts of interest with any of the commission members with either of these parties or with this, these documents. Hearing none. Um, you presented the presentation of pre-hearing order. Uh, motion disposition procedure matters, you've covered that. Uh, any stipulations have been there, so I think we're ready for the opening statement by Bryce. 
Thank you, Chairman. Good morning, commissioners, commissioner, commission staff, and members of the public. Thank you for allowing us to present our applications to you today. My name is Jill Durancy of Jost Energy Law, and with Jamie Jost, we are here on behalf of RISA 2 operating in docket numbers 1804-00360 and 1807-00536. On March 1st, 2018, RISA filed an application requesting that the commission establish an approximate 1,280 acre drilling and spacing unit and to authorize 21 wells for the production of oil, gas, and associated hydrocarbons from the Codell and Niobrara formations. For various reasons, RISA amended its application on April 18th, 2018 and requested a 1,280 acre unit for sections 35 and 36 Township 1 North, Range 66 West in Weld County. On April 18th, RISA also filed 16 applications for permits to drill wells within its unit, 12 in the Niobrara Formation, and four in the Codell Formation. The APDs were resubmitted in July and are currently pending commission approval. Those APDs have not been objected to or commented on by Kermagee. On May 25th, 2018, Kermagee filed a protest of the RISA application. More than a month after the amended RISA amended application, Kermagee also filed an application to establish a drilling and spacing unit and to authorize 30 wells for the Codell, Niobrara, and the Greenhorn formations for the east half of section 26 and all of section 35, Township 1 North, Range 66 West. Now, RISA will provide testimony that it executed its oil and gas lease with the Colorado State Land Board, secured a surface use agreement in an area that is well outside of 1,000 feet of any building unit, filed its application to establish its spacing unit, submitted 16 APDs long before Kermagee decided to file its spacing application in an effort to obstruct RISA's development plans. Now, it's important to review the legal standards applicable to the hearings today. These are the mandates set forth in 3460-116, subsections one, two, three, and four, and are provided in your PowerPoint for your review. Subsection one provides that to prevent waste, to avoid unnecessary wells, and to protect correlative rights, the commission on a proper application of an interested party may establish a drilling unit of a specified size or shape. Subsection two, the commission is authorized to establish a drilling unit, but no drilling unit may be smaller than the maximum area that can be efficiently and economically drained by one well. Subsection three, an order establishing the unit may authorize one or more wells on a drilling unit. And four, the commission may permit additional wells within the unit in order to prevent waste, avoid the drilling of unnecessary wells, or to protect correlative rights. The reason we have, ex we have included this so expressly in our presentation today is because as you can see from Kermagee's filings, Kermagee is likely going to present to you several arguments about the form twos and about the proposed horizontal wells within Rice's proposed unit. However, Throughout all of its filings, Kermagee has never disputed that Rice's 1,280-acre unit is an appropriate size or an appropriate shape, nor have they disputed that Rice's unit is not smaller than the maximum area that can be efficiently and economically drained by the proposed horizontal wells. RISA will provide substantial evidence that its proposed unit is the most efficient way to recover both the fee and the state minerals in sections 35 and 36, that one well will efficiently and economically drain less than the proposed 1,280 acre unit. It supports the drilling of additional wells in the unit to prevent waste, to, prevent, to protect the correlative rights of RISA and its mineral interest owners, will significantly reduce surface impact and the potential impacts of the drilling and completion operations to the neighboring landowners since its surface location is well over a thousand feet of any building unit and will also allow for the economic development of the proposed unit even with the cost of the front build incorporated 
and the necessary remediation of the two vertical wells in section 36. Those wells are similar to hundreds of other vertical wells located in the greater Wattenberg area that are part of every single operator's remediation plans on a daily basis. Now, in our closing, we will ask, that RISA will ask that you review its plan that it has in place and the benefit of such development plan on RISA, on Kermagee, and most importantly, on the state land board. We will ask that you consider RISA's collaboration, cooperation, and communication about the horizontal well development with the COGCC's engineering staff, as well as the permitting staff. We will also ask that you find that RISA clearly meets the mandates of the Oil and Gas Act by considering the substantial evidence that will be presented to you today that RISA has demonstrated, undisputed, that it has an interest within the proposed unit, that the Codell and Niobrara formations underlie its application <coughs> lands, that its first filed RISA's plan of development will prevent waste, will protect correlative rights, will reduce surface impacts, as well as impacts on the surrounding communities. We will ask, RISA will ask that the commission approve its 1,280 acre drilling and spacing unit for the 12, 22 horizontal wells for the development of Codell and Niobrara formations. And we will ask that you deny the Kermagee's subsequently filed application as it conflicts with RISA's application, does not allow for the, the development of RISA's assets and will effectively harm the correlative rights of both RISA as well as the Colorado State Land Board. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor McGee. Thank you. Uh, would, would you mind giving us just a moment to get our slide up, please? Of course. <laughs> Thank you. So, Mr. Chairman, I'm online. Thank you. So the record should reflect that Commissioner Holton has joined us. They believe he joined us right about 9 o'clock. Good morning, commissioners. Thank you very much for your time today. Uh, Mr. Rouse, thank you very much for all of your work getting this matter teed up for hearing. Uh, I know it's been a lot of hard work for you. Um, so today's hearing is going to be very technical. I, I hope that that's uh, something you, you all are looking forward to, uh, a very technical presentation. I know sometimes we, we get away from some of the technical aspects of oil and gas development in our presentations. Um, but as, as technical and complex as it is, it's actually a very simple issue today. It really boils down to just one question. Should you base your decision today on who filed its application first, or should you base your decision today on economics? Uh, simply put, uh, it's Anadarko's position that RISA cannot possibly meet its burden of proof to show that its drilling and spacing unit is economic. The first option, this race to file notion, that's not written anywhere into the statute. It's not in a rule anywhere. It's not in a policy anywhere. It has never been used as the single criteria for approving one particular application over a protest or objection or in preference to another application. There have been times when the commission has approved an application because one party looks like they have momentum, they're ready to drill. Um, they have approved applications because they uh, meet the criteria of the statute. In this case, the fact that an application was filed first cannot possibly overcome the fact that it does not meet the criteria of the statute. The, the second option, the economic option, that is written in your statute. In fact, it's very expressly stated right here in Section 2, which is required criteria for approval of a spacing unit. The spacing unit has to be economic. It, it cannot produce oil and gas at a loss. I think that's probably the most simple way to define economic. Before I get a little bit into um, what Anadarko is going to present to you today, I want to talk a little bit about the burden of proof. I know you guys hear a lot about this in many hearings, but I'm going to ask you guys to focus on that today. 
Yes, please. Sorry, just to briefly interrupt. I think we should notice it, it appears that probably today Kermagee and Anadarko are going to be used interchangeably. Yes, thank you. I'm All sorry. Right. So we just need to make sure that's in the record. Thank you. Um, so RISA has the burden to show that its DSU will be economic. It has that burden of proof. It must demonstrate to your satisfaction that its unit will be economic. If you conclude that it might be economic, but you're not sure, RISA has not met its burden. If you conclude that more evidence is necessary, that RISA has more work to do to figure out what the actual costs of its wells will be, RISA has not met its burden. And if you simply doubt that RISA's DSU will be economic, RISA has not met its burden. Kermagee will present evidence that its application does meet the express requirements of the statute. Um, it owns 100% of the working interest in its, in its proposed DSU. The target formations are present in uniform under the application lands. It's actually something the parties have all stipulated to and agreed about. Um, Kermagee's DSU will present waste and protect relative rights, and there's been no indication whatsoever that RISA opposes or disputes that. And finally, Kermagee's development plan will ensure that the Kermagee DSU will be efficiently and economically developed. Kermagee will present evidence that demonstrates that RISA's DSU, on the other hand, cannot possibly be economic. There are just too many obstacles. RISA has proposed uh, numerous front builds or, or step outs, the distance between where the well enters the ground and where it enters into the target formation that exceed the longest front builds that have ever successfully been completed in the DJ Basin. These are gonna add a tremendous amount, not only of expense, but also of risk. RISA's extended front builds have a high degree of collision risk with existing producing horizontal wells, and also some old plugged-in abandoned vertical wells. Among the many costs and risks that these anti-collision issues add, RISA will need to add drilling time, and it will need to account for the expenses of having another operator shut in its existing producing wells for a period of time. Most significantly, before RISA can frack its wells, it will need to locate It'll need to re-enter, and it'll need to re-plug numerous vertical wells, which are located directly underneath a dense residential neighborhood in the town of Lock Bowie, and beneath and right next to Lock Bowie Elementary School. The Commission's statewide horizontal offset policy mandates that these wells be satisfactorily mitigated, and Kermagee will present evidence that it is not possible to mitigate these wells both safely and economically. Kermagee has concerns about whether they can be safely mitigated at all, but to even try would make RISA's entire development plan uneconomic. The vertical wells are not similar to other vertical wells, as Mr. Ansi stated. They are among the smallest sliver of percentage of the most difficult wells to mitigate in the entire DJ Basin. They have no surveys, they have no casing, they will be very difficult to locate using the typical tools that operators use to locate wells, and even if they can be located, they will need to be re-entered, which would involve purchasing and demolishing homes in a residential neighborhood. Failure to do so would essentially turn the project into a science experiment in the hopes that other mitigation options than re-entering and plugging wells from the top would be sufficient to withstand the pressures of RISA fracking its wells mere feet from these old vertical wells. So the cost of doing this will just make RISA's project uneconomic. And Kermagee intends to show that RISA's application is premature. It does not have an accurate economic estimate for its development plan. It has not taken sufficient steps to determine the feasibility of mitigating the vertical wells. For example, it has not physically located even one of the vertical wells under the neighborhoods in Section 36 to Kermagee's knowledge. And finally, it has not planned its wells in such a way to minimize unnecessary costs such as extended front builds and risky, expensive anti-collision problems. Kermagee owns 100% of its DSU. It owns half 
of Rice's DSU. It is not only the working interest owner, but its affiliate Anadarko is the mineral owner. Kermagee and Anadarko do not want to have any part of wells that can't be drilled safely and economically. It doesn't want to be part of an experimental vertical well mitigation program under a neighborhood in a school. And simply put, RISA asked the commission to externalize the unacceptable costs and risks of its development plan onto an unwilling owner of half of RISA's proposed DSU. Kermagee simply believes that each party should be left to develop its own minerals. If RISA believes, as it's most likely going to assert today, that it can safely and economically mitigate the vertical wells in Section 36, it should be allowed to go do so, developing its Section 36 on its own, and Kermagee should not be saddled with the massive risks and costs of 50% of Rice's risky and costly development plan. So respectfully, Kermagee asks that you deny Rice's application and approve Kermagee's application, allowing each party to develop its own minerals, bear its own costs, bear its own risks, and bear the consequences of its own business decisions without externalizing the business decisions that RISA has made half onto Kermagee. Thank you very much. Very well, I believe we're now on to the case in chief by RISA. <laughs> Perhaps now is a good time, as reminded by our attorney, would be a good time to swear in all of our witnesses for both parties, if that's acceptable to both parties. Yes. <laughs> we should have charged admission today. We would have made money. Wow. Okay. So we'll do this as efficiently as possible. We're going to start with the... I think it's all gentlemen. Gentlemen on my left here, please, and then we'll just work with this to my right. If you just raise your right hand and state your name and say that you swear to tell the truth, go ahead, please. All right, I swear to tell the truth. Thank you. Casey Harless, I swear to tell the truth. Tim Cooper, I swear to tell the truth. Luis Rodriguez, I swear to tell the truth. John Desmond, I swear to tell the truth. Carol Lawrence, I swear to tell the truth. Nathan Bennett, I swear to tell the truth. David Falder, I swear to tell the truth. Bill Gonzalez, I swear to tell the truth. Robert Mulder, I swear to tell the truth. Bobby Chisel, I swear to tell the truth. John Repco, I swear to tell the truth. Dan Salander, I swear to tell the truth. Thank you all. Thank you. And um, just, Ms. Prine, would you tell us when we have five minutes remaining, or would you like to reserve five minutes? Thank you very much. And uh, just for, uh, again, housekeeping, please remember to speak into the microphone so that folks can hear us. <clears throat> um, first, we... Um, we have stipulated regarding the ownership of the minerals and the right to drill within the application lines. But um, today we have, please provide your name and your position with the RISA and your experience. Casey Harless, I'm Vice President of Land at RISA Energy. And I've been in the oil and gas industry specifically uh, as it relates to the land discipline for almost 13 years. And are you familiar with the RISA proposed unit and the application lines? Yes. Have you prepared exhibits for this hearing? Yes, I prepared the land exhibits. Can you please provide a brief description of the RISA unit? Yes, so it consists of sections 35 and 36 in Township 1 North, range 66 West. And what are the ownership interests in the application lands? So section 36, RISA owns 100% of the leasehold, and the state of Colorado owns the minerals. And section 35, being the west half of the unit, it's in, owned entirely by Anadarko for both fee minerals and uh, leasehold. And when you say Anadarko, you're referring to Kermagee? Kermagee, yes. Are there any other working interest owners in the RISA application lands? No, there are not. And when did RISA acquire its interest in Section 36? In 2017. Well, can you please describe the setbacks you're requesting in this application, in the RISA application? Yes, so we're requesting uh, a 460-foot setback, uh, which is customary pursuant to 318A. What about your interwell setbacks? 
which is 150 feet also customary. Now, can you describe what's on the surface of the RISA proposed unit? So three quarters of section 36 is, as you can see, covered by high density subdivisions. Um, and the Northwest quarter shaded in blue is owned by the state, la state land board. And on section 35? And 35 is owned 100% by Anadarko with some small subdivisions in the south half. Now, does RISA have a surface use agreement to develop its, its application lands? Yes, we do. And is the surface location located in an urban mitigation area? No, it is not. So what county is it located in? It's located in Weld County, and it's located outside of the municipalities of Lock Bowie and Brighton. And what's well. on the surface of your um, surface location? The current use is pasture land, and it's, in a, it, it's outside of 1,000 feet from any um, housing unit. Now, has Weld County or any other municipality protested or objected to your spacing application? No. And has the state land board objected to your spacing application? No. How far is the closest building unit to the surface? Outside of a thousand feet. How many acres did you secure in your surface use agreement? Uh, approximately eight acres. Can you describe the topography of sections 35 and 36? Yeah, for the most part, it's fairly flat land. Did you consider other surface locations to develop this proposed unit? Yes. Where else did you consider? In section 34, we considered a location there as well as in the northwest quarter of section 36. And why did you choose not to develop from those locations? Um, just because of the, the proximity to the high density, uh, high density urban areas. Now, um, you're aware that Kermagee is proposing a competing unit which would include Section 35, is that correct? Correct. Are you familiar with that unit? Yes. Now, if the commission approved the Kermagee unit, what would the impact be on Section 36 from a, a land perspective? Uh, it'd be, be difficult to efficiently uh, develop Section 36. Why? Um, because of the proximity to existing neighborhoods or high-density urban areas. And other back build issues that um, Luis, our CEO, can attest to. Now, why did you propose 12 mile laterals? Um, I mean, not 12, I'm sorry, I mean, two mile laterals um, within your proposed unit. There are some 12 mile ones offshore Scotland. <laughs> We're innovative, no. Yeah. Um, why did you propose two mile laterals here? I would say it's because it's becoming more customary um, as the most efficient way, uh, or most efficient length to uh, develop horizontally. Now, can you tell the commission when you're planning to drill these wells, if the commission approves your unit? Um, as soon as we get approval, it'd be likely in 2019. And what plans do you have for infrastructure um, for the production of the hydrocarbons? Um, so there, there's a considerable amount of infrastructure in place. Discovery Midstream um, has a couple lines in the immediate area in the same section. Now, in your opinion, does Rice's application allow for Kermagee's, Rice's, um, and both Kermagee and Rice's minerals to be developed in an economic way? Yes. And to protect your correlative rights? Yes. Okay. I'm going to direct you to this Anadarko or Kermagee's um, exhibit L6, Bates number 259. Can you tell me those black lines? Do you know what those are? Yeah, those are the permits the APDs filed by RISA. How many have, have has RISA filed so far? 16. And can you tell the commission, I'd just like to go over the history. What day did you file your spacing application? Uh, March 1st, 2018. What day did you amend your spacing application? April 18th, 2018. And what day did you file these spacing these APDs? April 18th as well. Now, do you know what day Kermagee filed its spacing application? Uh, May 25th. And when you filed your APDs, were there any 
pending APDs from Kermagee in either sections 35 or sections 36? No, there were not. Has Kermagee objected to the APDs that you filed within your proposed unit? No. Have they commented at all on the APDs? No. What day did Kermagee file its spacing application? Uh, May 25th. Now, can you explain to the commission why section 36 um, is so important to you and to your development plans? Uh, we're a small company and this tract of land is the largest contiguous block of leasehold that we own as a company. So it's very, very important to us um, and we don't have the luxury of not, um, not developing it. Thank you. All right, Mr. Harless, just a couple questions from my standpoint. Um, you may have already said this, but who is the mineral interest owner of Section 36? The state of Colorado. Okay, and does the state of Colorado own the entirety of Section 36? Yes. And does RISA have a plan for infrastructure of the production of the hydrocarbons in this unit? Yes. Okay, can you please describe that? Uh, repeat the... Yeah, the, what's the plan for infrastructure for the production of RISA's unit? It'd be connecting to uh, Discovery Midstream existing lines in, this, in the current section. Okay. And have you had detailed communications with Discovery Midstream? Yes. Okay. And once this unit is established, do you intend to secure the contracts for pipeline transport? Yes. Okay. And is it your understanding that the APD process is different than the establishment of the DSU process in front of the state? Uh, yes. Okay. And is it your understanding that all applications for permits to drill go through a technical review of the state commission staff? Yes. And that that state commission staff does have the expertise to review your APDs, correct? Yes. Okay, thank you. That will wrap up our direct testimony. And at this time, we request that exhibits A through E be entered into the record. Thank you. I so entered. So. Sorry. So yesterday we went through all the witnesses and then did cross and redirect, but I think today, given the number of folks that stood up, uh, we're going to do cross redirect and questions on a witness by witness basis. I think it might be a little more efficient. So Thank you. it's your opportunity to have your cross examination. Thank you. Um, for the record, no objection to the admission of the exhibits. Just a quick question on procedure. I believe that um, hearing Supervisor Rouse's order already admitted the, exhibit, the exhibits. Would you like us to ask them for them to be admitted after each witness, or are we okay to just um, assume I'm that they I'm fine are with fact? those, but I'll have to, I'm not sure what the appropriate procedure would be. If they've already been admitted as exhibits, then I don't think we need to admit them again. You've admitted everything, correct, Mr. Rouse? That's correct, unless they've got something new I haven't seen. Okay. So I just, if you have something new, just let us know and we'll admit that. Okay. Um, Mr. Harless, you mentioned that RISA has surface, a surface use agreement for its proposed surface location for its proposed horizontal wells, correct? Correct. Are you aware of the vertical well mitigation that will need to be done in section 36? Yes. Do you have surface use agreements to perform that vertical well mitigation? No, we do not. Uh, Mr. Har Mr. Harless, has RISA ever drilled a horizontal well in the state of Colorado? No, we have not. Has but RISA we ever have drilled a horizontal well sorry. anywhere in the United States? I'm oh, I'm sorry. I, I yeah, no, I heard his we have not as RISA. However, we have a lot of technical staff that have in prior positions. So maybe okay. not as un under the realm of RISA. Thank you. No more questions. So redirect. One redirect. Um, Mr. Harless, Mr. Parrott just asked if you um, were aware that vertical rec remediation would need to occur for two wells in Section 36, correct? Yes. Okay, and he asked you if you had secured... Objection, that's, that's a misstatement of my question. And I will uh, sustain that objection. That is a misstatement. Okay. Well, Mr. Parrott just asked you if you knew you had to conduct vertical well remediation, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, and if there is a need to 
obtain a surface use agreement for that remediation. Will RISA pursue that? Yes. Thank you. Very well. No more redirect? No more, thank you. Commissioners? Commissioner Hawkins. Just have a question. In section 36, uh, in the northwest quarter, doesn't look like there's any subdivision there. Is that right? Correct. So are there homes there or? No, not in the northwest quarter. Is there a surface location? availability in that quarter for development not to efficiently develop all of 36 because of the back build issues um, that you may end up stranding the east half the east half of section 36. and mainly because of the thousand the thousand foot buffer from from uh, that you have to be away or outside of all the high density or urban areas so if you, I mean, I'm just being theoretical here. If you if you put a surface location, say, up in the far northwest, say 10 acres or something of that uh, quarter section, you would still be over a thousand feet from homes. Or maybe I'm not. Maybe there are some homes there that I don't yeah, see, and they may be offset. Right. So that's that's actually the location we started with. Okay. And that's not feasible for for efficient development um, because it's limiting you to a lot of one mile laterals instead of being able to fully develop the entire DSU with two miles. All right. Thank you. Yep. Other questions? I have a similar one. Uh, what about the northwest quarter of section 35? It looks like that's just a essentially a crop circle uh, setting there, which then eliminates that breach. Yes. And then that lets you do the two mile laterals. Yeah, you um, still would have the concern of the municipalities. That was another issue. Um, our lease, we had to extend our lease with the state land board last February, and so we had a one-year extension on that. Um, what you can't see on this map is that there are municipalities for Lock Bowie and Brighton that would cover Section 35, and that was also the issue with 34. And so um, given that time was of the essence, that's why we chose a more um, remote location outside of, outside of the municipalities. I've heard a couple of times that there's just two vertical wells to remediate. Is that correct? That's correct. How many vertical wells are in section 36? Let's see, 12, approximately. 12. Yeah, 12. I think my other question yeah, Lewis will In Lewis will testify. I was just going to say, I'll, I'll hold the rest of the questions for the engineer. <laughs> Thank you very much. Any other questions for any other? All right. Very well. Thank you. Onward. I, wait, 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 wait. Sorry, <laughs> Mr. Holton. <laughs> Has anybody talked to the towns of uh, Lock Bowie and Brighton? No, we have not, since the surface location is outside of the, the jurisdiction. So you just assumed it was. How far out of the jurisdiction? Um, about a half a mile. So you didn't talk to Lock Bowie, even though you're a half a mile off of their city limits? No, and actually Brighton would be closer to our existing location. Brighton's got an LGD, don't they? Yes. And you never contacted them? No, we did not. Okay. So now you open the door, sorry. So is 35 in Brighton or Lock Bowie? 35 is in Brighton. In Brighton. Or actually, I'm, yeah, I'm sorry, it, it is in Lock Bowie. 34 is in Brighton. Was there any thought, did you even contact either, either municipality about a surface location or was it just the assumption it was just gonna take too long? We'd, we had, uh, through our contractors and, and that we've utilized for permitting, uh, we knew that it would require an MOU. Being a new operator, we knew that that process could take a lot longer, which was time we didn't have, so. Okay. 
Yes, certainly, Commissioner Overture. To follow up on um, Commissioner Holton's question. So I, I just want to make sure that I understand your proposed surface location is half a mile from the municipal limits of Lock Bowie, and how far away is it from the municipal limits of Brighton? Uh, it's about the same. So Brighton, Brighton kind of uh, runs along the south half of 34, and then there's some small tracks that it, I think it also might even incorporate in parts of 27, the east half of 27. Okay. So it's, it's an ununiform outline. Right. But it's approximately half a mile yeah. away as well. Thank you. That's all. all right. Thanks, Commissioner Overture. All right. Now we can move on. Mr. Chairman? Yes, Commissioner Holton. Is there any way we can get some crossroads? And I've requested this numerous times, but the sections and all that stuff, there's something that most of the public doesn't understand. I mean, is it along Road 2 and Road 29, or where is it? Yes, it's uh, along Road WCR 4. And uh, once. Commissioner Holton, this is um, Jamie Jost. Um, our engineering testimony with respect to its exhibit um, E1 does show the crossroads and so you do have that in your packet and i recognize you're you're not here to see it but in the powerpoint that we had passed out they're there but it's um the engineering exhibit e1 and bates number yeah bates number 49 that does show the can you just give me the crossroads so it's cr4 and what 35 37 exhibit j Exhibit J. Chairman Ben, I might be able to provide a fairly simple answer to yes. the commissioner's question. It's probably the closest crossroad is 168th and I-76, which is that intersection is just southeast of Lock Bowie Elementary School. If the commissioner would like to look that up on a map while he is on the phone, he would probably be able to locate the application lands very easily. All right, if you uh, on the uh, base number 49, Commissioner Holton. There's a map. Uh, this is in Rice's exhibits. It's uh, the, essentially one mile north of the intersection of Highway 7 and I-76. Is it or the two set where the two sections lie? I don't know if that helps you or not. No, I don't need a map. I know I've lived in this area all my life. I know exactly where it is. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I apologize as well. Maybe, but that does certainly provide some help to the folks who might be listening in to have a better idea about where this is located. All right, so Commissioner Holton, are we free to move on? Yes, Mr. Chairman. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Ken Cooper will be our next witness. Um, just to remind the commission, we have stipulated to the geology, so we are not going to present any geological witnesses um, unless they're necessary for rebuttal. So, And that is Kerr McGee's understanding as well, or if any commissioner would like to ask any questions about geology, we're certainly happy to respond with uh, our ge geology witness. Thank you. All right, great, thank you. Good morning, Mr. Cooper. Can you please provide your name, um, your relationship with RISA, and the familiarity with the contested units in the application lands? Yes, my name is uh, Ken Cooper. I'm with Petrotech. I'm a consultant to RISA. Uh, I've uh, been involved, and in my staff and I have prepared the, uh, the exhibits that I'll be talking about today. Okay, thank you. And have you testified in front of the commission before? I have. And did you prepare or oversee the preparation of the engineering exhibits in support of RISE's application up for hearing today? I did. I, I'm a PE, and uh, my staff uh, that was involved with this are, are also PEs. Great. Thank you. Now, can you please turn to your Exhibit J, and this is Bates number 49. And can you please explain what this is to the commission? Yes. Exhibit J is, uh, is a map. Uh, it's been distilled down to show the analog wells that we've used. So you can see uh, the two-section laydown 1280 DSU in kind of the lower right uh, corner of the center uh, township there. And then we've got the nine townships around it. The kind of green or 
uh, blackish dots that you see on this map, depending on how the copies came out, are Niobrara uh, horizontal offsets that we've used as our analog producers for the purpose of uh, calculating the, uh, the EURs here. Uh, and then the red dots are the uh, Cadell horizontal offsets that we've utilized in the vicinity for the purpose of our, our reservoir workup. And um, Mr. Cooper, can I ask you to speak up a little bit? Yes, and then get this a little closer. <laughs> Why is this exhibit important for the commission to understand? Yes, this gives uh, some information about the proximity of the offset analogs that we've used for the purpose of our analysis. Thank you. And can you please flip to the next page, which is Bates number number 50, our exhibit KA. Can you please describe this exhibit to the commission? Yes, exhibit KA is a set of decline curve analyses that we conducted for the 12 offset analog Niobrara wells that we've used in our uh, evaluation. And why is this exhibit important for the commission to understand? Uh, this is the, uh, the basis for our uh, EUR projections for our drainage area projections that we've included in the, uh, in the testimony today. And why do you need to present the EUR basis in support of RISE's application? Uh, well, it's required for us to provide information that shows uh, what the drainage area will be uh, of the proposed horizontals such that uh, the drainage area is uh, less than the acreage that is available in the, uh, the DSU that's subject to the hearing today. Great. Thank you. Can you please turn to the next exhibit, which is Exhibit KB, Bates number 51. Can you please explain this exhibit to the Commission? Yes, Exhibit uh, KB is uh, the uh, the same sort of uh, evaluation. It's a type cur or it's the uh, decline curve analyses that we conducted for the offset of Codell wells, um, and so I might uh, bring up that uh, the, the, there are twelve of each uh, that we've ended up uh, utilizing in the immediate vicinity of our uh, of our DSU today. And again, you're utilizing these to show the EUR from the Codell formation, correct? That is correct, okay. yes. And why, again, are we showing the EUR to the commission today? Yeah, the, the requirement is that we establish uh, the uh, total drainage that uh, could be expected and that that drainage uh, area uh, is less than the, uh, the available acreage within the, uh, the DSU. Great, thank you. All right, um, before we move on, can you please describe to the commission how you picked the wells in Exhibit KA and KB? Yeah, we had uh, slightly different methodologies, uh, but we wanted to make sure that we were uh, pulling information from the uh, publicly available uh, data on the COGCC website that is uh, most likely representative of the, uh, of the local uh, area. So for the uh, Exhibit KA, wherein we had our Niobrara offsets, there are actually many more uh, producers in this, uh, in this, or on this map in this area than what we've utilized. So we assigned uh, numbers to all of the wells that have uh, production data, and then we did basically random number selection to make sure that we didn't end up doing any cherry picking of our data. For the Codell wells, there are fewer uh, producers with sufficient data to be able to uh, establish uh, 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 decline curves. And so what we did is uh, basically a spiral out from the DSU that's the subject of the hearing today, and we just kind of went out in a spiral pattern pulling all the uh, the closest wells. And have you utilized this method before the, with the commission in past hearings? We have. We've done it in past hearings. We've also done it with the 511 testimony. Uh, and we've also done comparisons in certain areas where we've uh, pulled a dozen wells and we've compared the results that we've obtained uh, doing it this way versus doing a much larger data set and come to uh, very similar conclusions. In many cases, surprisingly, almost identical uh, conclusions with regard to the numbers. Great. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. All right, so moving on to our Exhibit L, Bates number 52. Can you please describe this exhibit to the commission? Yeah, this gets to the heart of our calculations for the purpose of the, uh, the testimony today. Uh, so what we've done is we've got two tables. Uh, the top table is for the Niobrara. The bottom table is for the Codell offset analogs that I've summarized in the map, and then the two sets of decline curves that we just spoke about. 
uh, this provides information regarding well names, locations, um, uh, et cetera. It, it provides a summary of the EURs that we had uh, calculated based on our decline curve analyses. Uh, it shows the lateral lengths and a variety of the um, input data with respect to thicknesses, porosities, saturations, et cetera. And then on the far right side, you can see kind of a yellow column. That yellow column is the calculated drainage area for each of those wells. And at the bottom of each, we end up having a summary, or a uh, not a summary, but a uh, uh, an average uh, based on the, the 12 analogs for each. Uh, then in the green column, what we have is we've got an upscaled uh, version of that drainage area where we've corrected, if you will, the drainage that was calculated for each of the offset analogs. Uh, many of which have variable lateral lengths, and we've upscaled each of those to the 9640 for the two-mile laterals proposed by RISA. Uh, so what we end up with is a drainage area of 46 acres upscaled for the Niobrara and a drainage area of 197 acres upscaled for the full two-mile lateral for the Codel. And have you also um, calculated the drainage areas in relation to the setbacks sought by RISA within the joint and spacing unit? Uh, we have. The, uh, the, the, the drainage radius, uh, which you can kind of convert area into uh, some dimensions or some distances based on the two-mile laterals, we've come up with less than 110 feet uh, for a drainage radius using a simple Yoshi method for the Niobrara and less than 420 feet uh, for a simple Yoshi radius based on the uh, uh, based on the values that we came up with for the Codel. And based upon your review of RISE's development plan for 22 wells in this unit, does that development plan drain less than the proposed 1,280 acre drilling and spacing unit? Yes, it does. And in your opinion, will the proposed development recover the hydrocarbons in the Niobrara and Codell in an efficient manner? Yes, it will increase recovery and it will uh, recover uh, hydrocarbon in an efficient manner. So have you reviewed Kermagee's exhibits in support of their drilling and spacing unit? I have. Okay. And um, is it your opinion that there's a difference in recovery from the 1,280 acre drilling and spacing unit proposed by RISA than that proposed by Kermagee? We've, we've come up with, with fairly uh, similar conclusions with respect to the types of well count that would be justifiable. Uh, there are some uh, minor differences in my opinion, but the conclusions I think are, are the same. If I were to adopt the values that, uh, that Kerr McGee had utilized, uh, essentially we would come to the same conclusions that I've come to. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. Mr. Parrott, uh, just a couple short questions. Um, Mr. Cooper, did RISA ask you to perform an analysis of the average length of the uh, front and back builds of the analog wells in your analog well set? Uh, no, they did not. Okay, so you would not be able to tell us what the average length of a front build or back build would be in any of the wells in the analog well set? Uh, no, I've not uh, done full workups on that. Okay, thank you, no more questions. Any redirect? No redirect, thank you. Commissioners, Mr. Hawkins. I'm gonna start looking at Commissioner Overture here pretty soon. <laughs> <laughs> so I just have a couple of questions. Um, looking at the uh, table that's in Exhibit L, um, I see that for the most part you've got the same porosity, water saturation, recovery factor, uh, productive thickness. Everything on each of the wells is pretty much identical for your analog wells. I know that. So you're saying that the reservoir pretty much hasn't doesn't change in this area. We we've taken an average across the area based on the geologic workups that had been done. That is correct, and there would be small differences uh, uh, between them, but we've used an average across. That is correct. Um, the one thing that I do see different, obviously, there's some production. You know, the EUR for each well and the GOR. Why is the GOR, I mean, do you have any 
description or what you would describe, how would you describe the GOR ranging from 1,000 to 4,000 or why, what, what's happening there? Yeah, we had uh, basically between yeah, 1,500 and 4,500 or so. Uh, it is somewhat variable uh, kind of across the area. Uh, that is the data uh, based on the, the raw information that comes right out of the, the production information that's been reported by various operators. Um, and so uh, there may be some differences associated with some uh, production methodologies. Uh, there, there would be a, a variety of things in addition to some uh, small variations in, in reservoir quality and perhaps exactly what's been uh, contacted by some of the fractures. But it's the GOR in this case is just the um, ratio of the EUR for gas and EUR for oil? Is that uh, No, no. The, this, this is the actual gas produced through the, uh, I believe it's the first six months of production um, versus the oil that's been produced. Okay. And so, so no, this a, is not... the first. Yeah, this is not an actual back calculation based on EUR. This is actually a ratio based on actual production data. So is it, are you, I mean, is it, would you categorize this as a oil reservoir fully yes. saturated? It, There's it, no free gas it, It's It's or? definitely a oil reservoir. Okay, yeah. so it's below or above bubble point or, yeah. Okay. Right. Thank you. <coughs> other questions from other commissioners? Okay. So along the same line as Commissioner Hawkins, when you think about the variation in GOR, perhaps more likely a volatile oil reservoir, and it's possible that some of the production methodologies that companies use might have been a factor in that cumulative gas oil ratio? Yeah. As I indicated, I would agree. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm curious about what, uh, if you calculated an average EUR per well uh, as part of that um, exercise that you went through here, because you did yes. a lot of other averages, and do you have those values for the oil and the, what's essentially the wet gas the, EUR? Yes, the, the EUR is on the order of 139 MBO, and the EUR, I'm sorry, for the Niobrara. Uh, the EUR, uh, from the perspective of MBOE, is about 262. Um, for the CODEL, the average of our analog data set is uh, 171 MBOE, and uh, in, uh, I'm sorry, 171 MBO, um, and uh, we're looking at on the order of 382 MBOE for the CODEL, and that's the average of the of the 12 wells for each of our data sets there. Which. Basically, or you know, notionally, most of those are. There's a couple of longer ones, but most of them are one mile, one mile uh, laterals. That's correct. Yeah, some of them are a bit more than one mile, but yes, they're one. I think they, they range anywhere from four thousand to. Uh, I think the, the longest is eighty five hundred feet, uh, but yes, the majority of them are closer to the one mile. I think the average of the. Um, well, I don't think I know the average of the Niobrara is fifty three fifty five. And the average of the offset uh, Codell's is 43.83. Yeah, which would explain you got a 1.8 and a 2.2 multiplier for that. Yes, I sir. think there is a code. It looks like there's a Narvera well there was 9,060 feet long. Uh, you are correct. So, and then uh, average a bit shorter for Codell. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. No more questions. We'll continue on to your next witness. Great. Thank you. If we could have a minute, please. And while we're doing that, Ms. Prine, how's the, how's the time allotment for both parties? Just do that. Um, for Rice, uh, 35 minutes exactly. For McGee, 50 minutes, 27 seconds. Okay. Thank you. Our next witness is Luis Rodriguez. Uh, Mr. Rodriguez, can you please provide your position with RISA and the familiarity with the application lands? Good morning. Uh, I'm the founder and, and CEO of RISA Energy, and I've been um, involved in all parts of this, both the acquisition, application, et cetera, of these lands. So you're aware of all of the ownership and issues surrounding Section 35 and 36? Uh, yes. Okay. And have you authorized the preparation of exhibits for this hearing? 
I have. Okay. And have you reviewed Kerr McGee's positions and exhibits submitted in support of their drilling and spacing unit? Yes. Bill, can you go to the next map? Okay. So you're aware that Kerr McGee is claiming that rises two mile laterals will not be economic, correct? Uh, yes. Okay. So first off, um, we would like you to address exhibit M. This is Bates number 54. Can you please tell the commission what this map is showing? So simply, it's, it's, you've got right at the center 35 and 36 of 1 North 66. And um, what's trying to be shown is the different surface areas that are being proposed. So on our end, you have the blue, uh, which is being used to drain both 35 and 36. Um, Kermagee, or Anadarko's, uh, two on, on section 26 and 35 uh, to drain half of uh, 26 and, and the full sum of 35. And then there's, um, there's another one on 36, which was kind of our thought of potentially being able to see if we could go north south, but we didn't think that, that, would, be, um, that would be as uh, efficient as coming uh, west to east. Great, and can you please move on to our exhibit N, which is Bates number 54. Can you please describe this exhibit to the commission and what RISE is trying to show? Yes, yeah, so we've expanded the view so that you can see basically five more miles uh, further west. And so uh, if you look at the, uh, at the uh, circle furthest to the west, uh, these are the LD Marcus as well. And so this is a section that uh, if, if you look closely, you can see that on section 34, you have the surface. And they're getting all the way to basically the eastermost half uh, of uh, section, section 2 and section 11. And so um, to us, this is a, a clear representation of just the ability to be able to get quite far away and in a very pointed fashion. We actually are working interest owners in these LD markets as well. Um, know the costs, participated in them, uh, feel quite positive about them. This is actually a clear representation of what uh, is able to be done in Adams County. And furthermore, is being corroborated by the fact that you can see on the middle circle uh, that Great Western is continuing to kind of use these builds to be able to get from what are surface areas that make sense to the minerals uh, where, where, they, where they've leased them or, or owned them. So based upon Exhibit N, it actually is becoming common in the greater Wattenberg area to use some of these longer front builds, correct? Not only in the, in the DJ, also in the Willison Basin and other basins, but yes, I mean, it's, it's becoming very common just to be able to get to the resources. Okay. So your proposal to utilize a surface location um, that is on pasture land and utilizing front builds is similar to other operators in the Wattenberg as demonstrated on this exhibit, correct? Yes. Okay, thank you. And you stated you participated in these wells, correct? In the LD Marcus, yes. Okay, and will you be participating in the Ottenson Great Western Wells? Yes, actually we've participated in um, many uh, wells that are in this small uh, square. We, we participated in the last year in over 30% of the wells drilled in the, in the DJ Basin. We're the very small percentage, but we know exactly what we're getting ourselves into and what other people are doing beyond just Anadarko. And, and based upon that participation, have you received data from the wells you've participated in? Yes, absolutely. Okay. And have you analyzed that data to develop your program within Section 35 and 36? It goes not only into our program, but everything that we do as far as how we think about the economics of these wells. I mean, to us, that's the, the key. And so... Great. And... Um, yeah, so we'll go ahead and move on. So with the next exhibit, Exhibit O, did you prepare this exhibit? This uh, is Bates number 55. Yes. Okay, can you please describe this exhibit to the commission? I just want to make sure you're talking about the slide, the, the, the right, the thing on the right is not. Um, the, yeah, let's yeah. go ahead and talk about the, the first. The, the table on the left, yes, yes. the table on the left. The table on the right, okay. Um, the table on the left, so what, what we were trying to kind of uh, Put together for the commission is uh, we we participated in a lot of wells so we grabbed some that were close and were actually drilled by Anadarko and and basically show 
Um, LL is lateral length. And so there's a one and a half mile and you can see the um, drilling cost, which is close to about a million. And then you see a 2.25, so basically 0.75 of a mile. Um, and it's only, it's, it's less than, it's like 150,000 extra for 0 0.75 of a mile. And so I guess our point is, look, we've participated in these uh, builds before. This is going to be an interesting build, but the fact is that from a cost standpoint, this is not of substance. So we calculated at 3%. Okay. And what do you mean by 3%? 3% per, per, uh, per well of the actual cost of the AFE. So as, as you can see, it's 139,000 of you know, the total. And on the table to the right of this screen, um, this table is from Kermagee's pre-hearing statement, correct? Yes. And what is the purpose of RISA utilizing this table this morning? I think the, um, for us, this was uh, put by Kermagee and we didn't really I feel like getting into a contest of uh, economics, we felt their economics were conservative, but showed that it was economic. It also showed that on a dollar basis, if you divide the amount of oil that they have us producing this versus the amount of drilling and completion costs and what they are doing in their section, us produces more efficiently per dollar, which, which makes sense because we, we're all doing two miles whilst they're doing kind of two miles and one miles. And then furthermore, you know, the interesting thing I found about this was that the, the difference, um, you've got the cost is the same, we're producing more oil, but they seem to be making substantially more money. The reality is that the difference between what they make and what we make is what the state makes. And so because they're the mineral owner, I think they, they're stating that their interest is both the minerals and the lease. We own the lease, the state of land boards owns the minerals, so we'd be paying that which makes the difference between the two. And does the difference result in Kermagee's economics looking, quote, better because they're not sharing with the state? In essence, I mean, I think, I think uh, and I'll paraphrase James, um, he said, this is best for Kermagee. I kind of absolutely completely agree. It's best for Kermagee, not for the state or for us. All right, so have you had the opportunity to review information regarding the existing vertical wells in Section 36? Did I said Mr. Parrott? Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, no offense, more. you can call me Joe. James, please. Okay, you can call me Luis as well. Okay. <laughs> well now that the formalities are over, <laughs> so can you please, um, I'm sorry, have you had the opportunity to review information regarding existing vertical wells in Section 36? I have, yes. Okay. And how many vertical wells are there within Section 36? There's 12. Okay. And Kermagee has claimed in its filings that there's approximately five to six wells that would need remediation in Section 36, correct? Uh, yes. Okay. And based upon RISA's horizontal evaluation for its applications for permit to drill submitted for this unit, how many wells did RISA determine need to be mitigated for the horizontal development? So. Uh Riser with the state uh, worked through it and ended up uh, narrowing it down to two. Okay. And can you please explain which of the two wells are necessary for the remediation? So the, the simplest way I can describe it is, is it's the two red dots um, in, the, in the center of the page. So if I were to describe it more clearly, um, one is on the south, um, what is that, south uh, uh, west and then northeast, and then the other one is on the southeast, northwest. Does that make sense? It's the. And if you're looking at Bates number 271, which is Kermagee's exhibit L7B, I believe. I can, point it. can you point that out? So yeah, I don't yes. Know. It's a good thing I didn't have to get up there. And, <laughs> <laughs> and would it be fair to state that one of these wells is the state 6-36CG? Yes. Okay. And the other one is the state of Colorado 4-36CG? Yes. Okay. Now, you had stated that RISA has been in communication with the state regarding the remediation of these two wells, correct? Yes. Can you please describe that communication? Uh, so it, it's been just, it's been an ongoing Objection communication. Objection 
I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. I have an objection that this is hearsay. Oh. I'm sorry. I was. Could you restate the question again, just so we can understand that, please? Well, RISA has been in communications with the state, correct? Yes. And who have you been in communications with? Uh, both Diana Byrne and uh, Eric Jacobson. Okay. And have those communications resulted around the remediation of the two wells you just described? Yes. Okay. And based upon the, that communication, um, is remediation, has, has a remediation mitigation plan been requested by the state? Yes. And what is that plan? So the plan as it stands is um, they've asked us to remediate the two wells. They want us to get all the way down to 3,000 feet and put a cement plug that we can prove that, um, that we can tag. If uh, we aren't able to get to 3,000 feet, the ask is to go all the way up to 1,500 feet to basically protect the aquifers, the Fox Hills, and put a cement plug there and tag it. That's the... And based upon RISA's evaluation of the remediation necessary for these two wells, um, do you have to be right on top of the wells to do this remediation? We believe that not, that doesn't need to be the case. Okay. And if you're not on top of the wells, how do you do such remediation? So you you come from the side. I, um, if I were, should I draw this? No. no. Okay, I'll talk okay. about it. Um, <laughs> Basically, what you're doing is you have the, the lands to the north, well, it's not up there, the lands to the northwest where it's very clear. And so you're coming from the side and intercepting. So basically, the same thing that you use for anti-collision, you use to get to the well. And once you get to it, you, you, because it's, it's, it's an open hole well, you, you drill, get into the vertical, clean it, put a plug, and then get back out and close. So with the remediation you have just described, um, could you be um, farther away from the school as Ben Kerr-McGee has alleged? You can be, you're gonna be a thousand, you're gonna be more than a thousand feet away. Okay, thank you. Now, is it your opinion that the state engineering staff um, has the expertise to talk to you about the remediation required? I think so. they're very knowledgeable, yes. Okay. And has RISA estimated the cost for remediation of these two wells? We have an approximation, yes. Okay, and what is that? We believe that it's going to be, for each well, somewhere in the region of four hundred dollars to $500,000. Okay. And what is that cost based on? Basically, it's, it's, it's putting the uh, rig that is needed and everything that goes around uh, needing to, to drill to 1,500 feet and to 3,000 feet, and then timesing it, which is we think give or take because you don't need a uh, you're not drilling very deep and so you don't need a full rig you need kind of a you could probably do it with a sputter and a workover so our thought is um twenty thousand dollars for all the equipment around the rig and then uh 20 to 25 days should give us ample opportunity to have multiple attempts to tag the well get in clean it uh put the cement tag back clean get out and based upon your estimation for cost, um, those costs would be spread over the cost of development of the entire unit, correct? Yes, you're talking about a million, a million dollars over $75 million, I mean, to us. That's... Okay, so that would be approximately less than 1% additional cost for each well? Yes. Now, if I could have you flip to Bates number 340, and this is in your packet, just one slide back. Um, Luis, why why do we have this? Why do we have Kermigee's exhibit in Rise's testimony? I, I think this is going to be where the crux comes. So, if, you know, if, if you look at our well costs, um, we've we've got it above what what Anadarko has, and so four four point seven million, and we're adding give or take uh, a couple of hundred thousands per well for this mitigation and the extra the extra leg in that four point seven. Um, Kermagee has us at 8 million, uh, which is almost double. And so I'm, I'm, I'm curious to hear, hear them out as to why that's the case, but we, we definitely believe that we're kind of in opposite sides of where we think this is going to land. And do you believe that based upon Kermagee's economics they've put forth that the cost per, rel, per well in this unit would be $8 million a piece? Yes. I mean, that's... 
based upon Kermagee's economics. Kermagee's, yes. Okay. And that is not Rise's economics, though, correct? No. And based upon your testimony that you've presented today with the front build and with the remediation cost, do you believe, or is it your opinion, that those wells will be much less than $8 million cost? I mean, we're, we're talking significantly less, not just like, we, we were at 4.7 with what Kermagee put together, we, which we thought was conservative because they've already AFE'd us for four right next to this, a mile away. And so we, we actually believe that we'll be a little higher because of all the different pieces, but not a lot. They're all the way to eight. And based upon your analysis with your economics, um, is it your opinion that RISE's development plan is economic for this unit? Yes. Now, just for um, to go back through this, who who owns the minerals under Section 36? State Land Board. And who are the beneficiaries of oil and gas development on State Land Board lands? Uh, public schools. Um, parks and i think it's actually the budget that the state has so now kermagee's representatives have stated that risa has never drilled a well in colorado is that an accurate statement i would, I would kind of disagree with that objection because... I, that's another misstatement right i think it was um, never drilled a horizontal well okay well let me rephrase then James stated that Reza has never drilled a horizontal well in Colorado. Okay. Is that accurate? Is that Again, correct? that's another misstatement. I never stated it. I asked the witness a question correct. about it, and the okay. witness answered the question. Correct. So let's, so let's try I to... I believe be that was stated in his opening, but I'll move on. So has Reza ever drilled a horizontal well in Colorado? Okay. Uh, yes. We've, we've uh, partnered up with a company called Highlands uh, and Halliburton. And so we had a three-way partnership with a joint technical team that drilled two wells in 5 South 64 West Section 15, uh, the Powell and the Wild Horse. Okay. And what's the significance of um, the wells in 5 South 65? I think those and, and others, we, we've had to deal with remediation. We've been actively involved in all the process. Um, and the reality is that we use the same vendors um, as other um, um, oil and gas operators in, in the in the state use, and so. Okay. And those wells were in the Lowry bombing range, correct? They were, yes. Okay. And that's also a unique area that requires extra remediation evaluation, correct? Yes. Okay. And did RISA work with Highlands and Halliburton um, to understand the remediation necessary for wells within the Lowry bombing area? Yes. And one last question. Um, you are aware that the commission has rule 317R and 317S regarding anti-collision um, concern or mandates, correct? Yes. And RISA has evaluated your development plan with respect to the anti-collision requirements of the rules, correct? Yes. Thank you. That will conclude our direct of Mr. Rodriguez. Very well, Mr. Parrott. Uh, Luis, thank you for allowing me to call you Luis. I'm not sure that I would get the exact pronunciation of your last name, just so, so thank you. Um, you just discussed some wells that you uh, participated in with Highlands Natural Resources in sections 15, 16, and uh, 4 South 65 West, correct? Uh, it's 5 South 64 West. I'm sorry, it, 5 South 64 West, okay. Are there uh, vertical wells located in those sections? Yes. Are they under neighborhoods? They're not, no, that's a bombing range. Okay. Or we used to be. Are there any schools near those vertical wells? Nope. Okay. Um, turning back to your exhibit N, that would be Bates number 54. Uh, you reference some front builds or back builds that are varying between maybe three and 5,000 feet, correct? Yes. Um, how many of these wells have been drilled? 32. Not permitted, but actually drilled? Yeah, actually drilled. Okay. So did you participate in any of these wells? All of them. Okay. Um, are you aware that they're showing up on the commission's website as not yet drilled? 
have you seen the amount of work the commission has to do to keep this up to date? Yes, I am fully aware of how hard the commission works. And I appreciate that reminder. What is the longest front bill that's ever been completed in the DJ Basin? That's a good question. I don't know. Approximately 4,700 feet sound correct? I'd actually think it's more, but yeah, I mean, that sounds reasonable. Are you aware that uh, at least seven of your wells exceed the longest front build ever completed in the DJ Basin? Yes. Okay. Uh, are you aware that your wells in the south half of the RISA DSU come within just a few feet of Verdad's existing producing wells in section 34? As a drone, yes. Are you aware that it's customary that when you are completing a well within a few feet of an existing producing well, that uh, the offset operator, offset well operator would shut in its well for a period of time? Yes. Are you aware that the operator that is completing the wells generally pays for the lost production during that period of time? Yes. Um, have you ever, or has RISA ever performed a vertical well mitigation in the DJ Basin? Actually, yes. We did two in 1 South 68 uh, in the Mandel properties. Did those wells have surveys? I don't recall. They did not, no. Did they have casing? Yes. Were you able to place a recompletion rig on top of the wells, or did you come in from the side? No, it was from the top. Have you ever complete, have you ever remediated a vertical well from the side as you proposed to do in section 36? I have personally not, but um, we have several people that we are working with that have. Um, are you aware of the contingencies that can arise when you come in from the side of a well rather than from the top? Yes. Um, are you aware that the best way to deal with those contingencies is then to place a rig on top to achieve re-control of the vertical well? That's one way. And does RISA have a contingency plan to put a workover rig on the top of the vertical well in the neighborhood in the event that it loses control during recompletion? I think that'd be the extreme. Um, the mo most likely option is that if we lose control, it's going to come to the well that we're drilling, not the well that's on the vertical. But yes. If you do lose control of the recompletion, are you able to put a rig on the surface on top of the vertical well to re-control the well? I guess I'll say it again. The, the fact is that the, the most likely outcome of this, if there was any issues to that effect, would be that the the control would be lost on the well that we're drilling, not on the well that's drilled because it's already plugged. Uh, Lisa, I, I, I appreciate that statement, but it's not an answer to my question. If, if you wouldn't mind um, answering the question about whether there is a plan to put a vertical rig on top of the vertical, well, I'm sorry, a recompletion rig on top of the vertical wells in the event you lose control in the vertical wells. I understand you think it's more likely you would lose control in the horizontal. But in the event you do lose control on the recompletion? So, so I'll, 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 I'll put it this way. The going through the whole analysis of the probabilities of, of that being the case, the that being very low probability, high impact, yes, the answer would be we would have uh, a plan which would, in, would entail uh, putting a rig on top. So yes. Would that plan involve purchasing homes in a residential neighborhood? You know, I, I think for both wells, you might need to purchase a home if that's the case, yes. Um, about what size of a location would you need to put a recompletion rig in place in that contingency? Uh, probably an acre, at least. Okay. And are you aware of the average lot size in the neighborhoods in Lock Bowie in Section 36? It's like half. Does a sixth of an acre sound about right? Yeah, sounds about right. Okay. Have you spoken with any of the homeowners uh, whose houses are located above or next to the existing vertical wells that will require mediation? Not yet, no. Are you aware if any of them would be willing to sell their houses in the event you needed to get onto the surface? No, as I, I said, I haven't spoken to them, so 
How can I even okay. be aware of that? Um, have you done an estimate for the costs of relocating uh, a, a homeowner who is not currently trying to sell their house? So I, I'm going to check just on the basis that a lot of this may be irrelevant um, from the standpoint that there's speculation in these questions that are being asked, as well as the fact that we are here for DSU application. I mean, I've sat here and listened to the line of questioning and you know, understand where Kerr McGee is attempting to go with this, but the establishment of the drilling and spacing unit is much different than the vertical mitigation aspects that tie to the form twos that are not subject to this application today. So I, I'm going to just register for the record um, an objection on this line of questioning that it does call for speculation and would be irrelevant to the issues put in front of you today. I'll sustain it and on the grounds primarily in that you're going to eventually have to ask Luis to do a probabilistic assessment of the various ways you would have to intervene on this. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure that that is really relevant to this. I think, I, I think we've gone far enough that the commission understands that there is that potential that exists. Um, there is a certain risk that, that it may occur. And I think probably at some point in time, you're, you, your testimony includes some things about the potential costs associated with that. So I think I will sustain that. Chairman Benton, may I be allowed to respond? Yes, well, you may. Okay, thank you. Um, while our testimony certainly does provide information about the costs, um, RISA has the burden of proof. It is up to RISA to demonstrate that it can show that its project is economic. It's not up to Anna Darko to show, I'm sorry, Kerr McGee, to show that its project is uneconomic. And if RISA has not done the very simple work of determining the costs of remediation that will be necessary for development of its DSU, I can't see how the commission could possibly find that it's met its burden of proof. And as for the relevance issue, even RISA has recognized that vertical well mitigation will be necessary in order for its DSU to be developed. So it's definitely not irrelevant. This is part and parcel of the economics of its DSU. And simply because there is also a process of for associated with a Form 2 does not make the costs irrelevant. Um, so I would respectfully request that you overturn the objection or deny the objection. I, I certainly will be happy to refrain from further questions along this line, but I would be. So let me ask this question of you, Mr. Parrott. Uh, you um, asked what they estimated for the cost would be to remediate those vertical wells, and they gave you an estimate of 500000 per well. My understanding of that is their estimate, which you asked them to assess that in their economics. They assume that that is the most likely case for them for remediation. I am struggling with proceeding along this line of questioning because, again, goes back to what is the possibility that they have to move a rig in and then they have to do a probabilistic assessment of that. I think they have given you what you asked for, which is what the estimated cost is that they have estimated to remediate the wells. I certainly appreciate your comment, Commissioner Benton. I think um, maybe the, the best way to recognize this is, as Luis himself put it, which in, in Rice's opinion, this is a low probability, high impact result. And RISA specifically recognizes that even though it may be a low probability that it, it would be a high impact. And I think it's up to the commission today to decide if that impact is high enough. In other words, a vertical well blowout in the middle of a residential neighborhood and school area that the commission determines that it is willing or not willing to approve the DSU based on an assumption that that low probability, high risk situation won't occur. Very well, all I will ask that of the commissioners, do we all understand that that probability exists? I think we get the point. Okay, Thank let's you. continue on. I will sustain the objection. Okay. Um, Lisa, are, are you aware of the commission's statewide horizontal offset policy? Yes. Are you aware that that policy states that all plugged in abandoned and dry and abandoned wells within 1,500 feet of a horizontal completion must be mitigated? Yes. And are you aware that a number of RISA's proposed completion stages would come within 
anywhere from a few feet to 1,500 feet of any one of those existing DNA or PNA wells in Section 36? Yeah, I mean, that's the DJ. Look at that. Look at that picture up there. There's red dots everywhere. Thank you. Um, do you currently have a contract for sales of your gas, your natural gas? It, it makes no sense for a company our size to get into a contract, which Please, I, basically binds you. I, I, okay, I understand. So the short answer is no, we're okay. not in a contract. Mr. Thank Parrott, you. if you could let him answer the questions. Please. No, I appreciate that. And if you could just stick to a yes or no answer with a yes or no question, I would really appreciate that. Um, do you have a, a rig under contract to drill the wells that you're proposing? Nope. Um, do you have a contract for produced water disposal? Nope. How are you going to move the liquids away from your wells? Which one of them? Um, your horizontal wells. No, I know. Oh, which I, liquid? Yes. Uh, let's start with oil. So, you know, the interesting thing is that we are a stone throw away from the oil and gas refining of uh, discovery. I mean, we're, we're literally probably at the best place because you will have the lowest line pressure. So oil and gas will go to midstream, which is, I mean, literally a stone throw away. Okay, so is, is your plan to try to negotiate a contract to pipe your oil? Yes. Um, have you spoken with the midstream providers in the area about that yet? We have. We've spoken to, we've spoken to Discovery. Um, we okay. haven't spoken to Wes. And do you have a contract with Discovery yet? That's an answer. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Contract for oil. So I'll go back. We haven't got a contract with Discovery because it doesn't make sense to get into a contract that binds you if you don't have the DSU approved. And what's your plan for the water disposal? The water most likely needs to be trucked. Do you have a contract for trucking the water yet? Really? No. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate answering that. Um, so it'd be fair to say that as far as the uh, discounts or prices that are going to be incurred for gas sales, um, oil takeaway, uh, produce water takeaway, you don't know what your prices will be yet, correct? I'm going to object to the fact that he has already addressed that there is a no, there's no contracts on all these. I'm going to redirect Mr. Rodriguez on these issues, asked and answered. I, I don't I, 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 answer. perhaps, I will sustain it. Perhaps you can reword that in a different way. Sure. Such that it would say that, you know, how did you come about to make your cost as prepare your well cost estimates for or your operating cost estimates for your economics and and that might provide an opportunity to obtain what you're looking for uh, but it's going to be up to the other attorneys to decide whether or not to object to that line of questioning but i will sustain Ms. joe's uh, objection okay it sounds like mr benton i think you're you've already raised the issue and i'll just let the witness address it on redirect or during commissioner questions if if he wants um Luis, do you, do you have currently surface use agreements in place for the vertical well remediation that you believe will be necessary? I'm nope. going to object. I believe that was already asked and answered by that Mr. Harless. That one has been asked and answered. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot my own question. Yeah, you, okay. you've already asked that okay. one. Sorry. In that case, I have no further questions. Thank you. I would be, it would be a very high probability that you have a redirect we have or two. Redirect. <laughs> All right. Um, Luis, has RISA taken the cost of the midstream and um, disposed water trucking into account as part of its economics? Yes. Can you please explain that to the commission? So, so I'll go back to a statement I said earlier because I, I think it gives credence to how we come up with our economics. We've, we've participated in over 30% of all the wells drilled last year in the DJ Basin. That's, that's, we understand the cost, we see all the LOE, we see all the deducts for every single well that we participated in. If, if I actually look at the amount of DNC or CAPEX that Anadarko put into the DJ Basin, it was 25%. So they represent 25% of the activity. We're on 30% of the activity. So I feel like I know my numbers really well as to how I came about 
what this is going to cost, where we need to be thinking about uh, um, our cost structure, and what are the things that we need to be addressing. And if this DSU is approved, would RISA proceed with executing contracts with a third-party midstream company? Yes. And would those contracts provide for transportation of oil and gas? Yes. And if RISA would proceed or would it receive approval of its drilling and spacing unit, would you enter into trucking contracts for disposed water? Yes. Thank you. Is it your understanding that you have to have those contracts in place before you get a DSU approved? No. And is it your opinion that Kermagee is using economics to show worst case scenario in this instance? Yes. And is it your opinion that Kermagee is using those economics to incite fear? Um, that's Objection, okay. prejudicial, there's, that I, was. I will sustain that one also. Okay. That one is withdrawn. Um, I don't have any further questions for you. Thank you. Very well, Commissioner Hawkins. <laughs> Do you want to engage? <laughs> Did you want to end up yet? Well, I'll just try to expedite. Just a few questions. Just, you know, I have some concerns about um, how successful you'd be trying to remediate two wells with a, a horizontal. Um, have Have you seen that done before? Or you said I think you already said that some of the people you work with have had experience with that. Can you? Just, so give I'll, us a I'll give more a, information on that because that would be my concern is trying to remediate those wells, yeah, not absolutely. from a surface location. Absolutely. Uh, the the experience in general is in okay. no, the the experience in general is in California. This is actually done quite frequently on verticals in Bakersfield that are uh, tagged. Actually, in, even in the DJ, I think uh, Anadolco tagged from um, from the side into a vertical well, and they'll tell you why. Um, they thought it was a, a feat of engineering, um, I'm sure, and which they're very proud of. Uh, but the, the reality is that it can be done. Um, well, if, it, if the well has no casing, um, how do you know if you're in the well? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. So the, the, the well does actually have casing all the way to 700 feet. Okay. And so Surface. what we're thinking is um, we use the anti-collision to basically find this well, uh, you tag it at around 700 feet, and so you know where it's at, because that's part of the issue, knowing where this well is. So once we find the well, um, then the, the next uh, step of it is go back and try to hit that exact same spot as you're going vertically, and so you get into the hole. Once you're in the hole, the hole guides you, because in general, uh, right. what we've seen well, is, it's, gonna be it's, it, it's um, the to the people that we've spoken that have been um a pna and open holes the ones that we've seen the hole integrity is actually really good so that's i, I think i, I understand where uh, anadoka is coming from um, but i think that thought a little bit outside of the box this actually makes uh, a lot of the pieces that are used on a daily basis make a lot of sense but i i guess just from my point of view it it is going to be um a little bit of an experiment. It's going to be new. It's going to be something new in the basin. Yes, I agree with that. Especially because it's open, not cased. When it was cased, it was milled. Um, so in that regard, yes. Uh, I I do think as well that you know from our standpoint, we see it as an opportunity because there's a lot of stranded assets that are uh, stranded because of this exact same issue. So we actually think that um, we hope to before we do this to get um, Anadolka to uh, give us some of those lands. And if we're successful, we can actually do this on the rest of them. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? Before I get my kick at the end. <laughs> OK, Commissioner Jolly. So <clears throat> excuse me. Is this, has this well been P&A'd, the, the two verticals that we're talking about? They were, but but not to the um, to the extent that they needed to. So they have two plugs right now. They weren't filled with concrete to the top. So there's concrete at the top, and there's concrete at about 700 feet. But the Fox Hill goes all the way to about 1,200 feet, and so the the um, uh, staff has basically said, "Look, you need to protect the the aquifer, so you need to put a plug below the one that's currently set." 
are they straight vertical or were they directional? So there's no survey. Um, uh, the so when you go so that's one of the the keys to it. Uh, but it um, it was done as a vertical. So let's let's put it that way. It's a 1981 hole. And were were they marked at all as being abandoned, above or below surface? Do we know? Um, uh, yes. The, 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 so do you it want to reset? It wasn't a requirement at the time, no. I guess. And do we believe there's actually a house right over the mm. what, what the well bore? No. I actually believe that one is um, in the backyard of one of the houses, uh, and actually you can get through the backyards to those to those wells, to that well, and the other one is on the side of the house. I just wonder if people that live by those wells even know they're there. I I probably this is speculation on my part. I think they know because they're probably four to ten feet under. Thank you. Interesting. We had a, we actually, as a commission, we had a presentation. I think it was from Anadarko several years ago that they went back in and, and plugged a well that was, I think, less than six feet from the foundation of the house um, and demonstrated whether they did a, an amazing job of being able to go in and do that, um, being able to go back and re enter and plug a well. But they did have to, they did at that point in time, they brought the rig in over the top of the well. Did have one more question. Where, where would you do the, the remediation work from? I think that I'd go from, um, what, is that working? Um, what, what, would you like the slide pulled back up to answer that No, question? well, yeah, that's fine. It's the, it's the northwest quarter where the state lands are, so it's open, it's open, it's open space. So if I go back here. And we've already um, discussed with the state surface there, so that's where I'd get that where it's open. state land board? Yes. And don't they have an NSO on their lease? No? We actually already had an agreement with them as we were thinking about that as a potential of going north-south. And, and how far approximately is it from? The wells in question? Yes. It depends where you put the surface, but probably 1,000, 1,500 feet. And you can do all that with a just a work over rig? I think a spudder rig would be the best just to have the extra horsepower there. I wouldn't I wouldn't go with a work over rig. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Ager. Yeah, I just need a little bit of help. Um, can you kind of define what you mean by participating in thirty percent of the DJ wells or um, the Absolutely. wells on, on these exhibits? Yes, so uh, be, so because we've we've acquired leases and or have um, acquired minerals um, through force pooling uh, by Anadarko and others, uh, we end up giving the choice to participate with our take. So they give us an estimate of what they think their cost is. It never uh, gets to um, you know a speculative amount. It's, it's usually reasonable, and um, and we get the choice to participate or not. And so we've, we've in essence, uh, bought these very small acres that people ended up losing to force pooling because they couldn't, usually if you're a mineral owner and you don't lease, you get the choice to participate. So that could be something in the region of half a million to a million. We come and offer uh, a bonus for that instead of losing it to the force pooling and participate and put the capital to work that way. And so when you participate, are you basing your, when you say, I, because we participate, we know how much it costs, are you basing that on kind of the revenue that you make off of that? Um, or do you get details on? You get everything. I mean, let, let me, well, let me restate that. Not everything, obviously, but you get daily rates, you get the gross LOE. So the gross, uh, basically an LOS statement. So you get all the drilling reports, all the completion reports, all the gross costs, and you just get your percentage piece. Okay. And then um, if we look at uh, Bates number 55, I was, I'm just a little slow on these tables. So the tables on the, on the left, 
are those the costs, estimated costs for RESA or Anadarko? That's actually Anadarko's costs. Anadarko's costs. And so a statement that you said is that RESA produced, can, you can interpret these to indicate that RESA produces more efficiently per mile. So that's, that's on the right hand side. Okay, can you walk me through that, please? Yes, absolutely, I, I can. Uh, and so, this. So my my point in in saying that was the fact that two mile laterals are a more efficient way of producing than one miles. And this this is backed by just. I, I mean, I, I don't think Anadarko would um, actually dispute this, seeing that in their operating statement in Q two, they bragged about the fact that in the DJ Basin they were averaging eight thousand. So my point in saying that was that if you look at the gross oil EUR, they have for their project 3,953.7. Uh, they've put for our project 4,321.6. And see what is my oil per dollar invested. And the only reason it's not because we're any better than Kermagee, they're they're one of the best operators in the basin. It's just the mere fact that the way that we're proposing it is a more efficient way of draining, uh, from an economic standpoint, these sections than on a one-mile lateral basis. Because this has actually repercussions not just on this project, but on other projects around it. Because yours is a two-mile proposal. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you. And then, um, can you describe what anti-collision technology is? Please? It's basically uh, it's like magnetic resonance. It's, it's basically looking for, for iron, for, for the well. And it, it can, you're, you're steering your well, and it's telling you, hey, is there, any, is there anything of interference in a, in a radius in front of you? And so usually what it's used for is, okay, well, I have a, a vertical here or a horizontal. I want to stay away from it. So this kind of gives me an alert as to, okay, I need to kind of veer um, you know, in whichever direction it's telling you. Um, so that's important because that's needed to get around all the well, the wells aren't up there, but all the wells that are in the DJ. What what I'm saying is we can actually use that same technology to pin the well that we're trying to get to because it's got a casing at, at a given set depth. And so I'm saying, okay, well, instead of not colliding with it, you're actually looking for it in these mitigation wells. Okay, and that's the casing from 700 feet. To 700 to feet, yeah. And so, in general, it's it's stated like an op open hole, which means it doesn't have a, a, a pipe casing. Mm -hmm. But the fact is, it does have to a given set depth, which is really helpful because it allows us to pinpoint exactly where that well is. Okay, great, thank you. No worries. Absolutely, Commissioner Elmerker. Um. So I would assume even if everything goes according to plan when you're doing the remediation work, if you're coming in from the side, mm -hmm. that you would still want to have um, people, some people there at the top, at the surface, in order to ensure that everything's going according to plan. Mm -hmm. um, I would also think that you would wanna be prepared for any contingencies, something goes wrong, you wanna be prepared to be able to react to something if, if it doesn't look right on the ground. Is that accurate? Yeah, that's, that's absolutely accurate. Okay, so um, in light of that, can you help explain why there hasn't been any outreach to the landowners whose property you would need to be, you would need to have access to, and also to the local government? Because I would, I would think it would be really important for the local government and first responders there to be aware of what was happening and be yeah. able to provide feedback, input, and support uh, to manage the situation. I 100% I, I agree. And, and so I feel like there is steps to getting to where uh, we are actually able to drill the wells, of which, you know, the first one is, oh, is there even a project to be had here? Which is why we're here. And so then, because you, you don't, I guess the point, the way that we see it is, okay, if there's a project to be had, then we sit down and properly put, with probabilities, what are all the, the ways that we are encountering, that, that we think that this could go wrong, and what are the mitigation efforts, and what are the probabilities for those? And so for me, to have an informed um, uh, discussion with the, both the city, uh, or the, the, is it the city? The county and 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 the and the owners. I would like to have that in front. And so I, I'm to the point that I feel very very comfortable that this can be done safely. Um, and 
if if this goes ahead, I think that you're absolutely right that you'd want to talk to the to the people whom not just the one that's on top of the you know that has the well on its backyard, but the the, the people around it. And you'd want to talk to the to the to the um, city as well. Or the council. So let's. I mean, I I appreciate your. Um, I think there's a little bit of a chicken and egg mm -hmm. problem here yes. with deciding whether or not there's a project to be had because it seems to me that if if remediation and presence on the surface is a necessary prerequisite to developing the minerals in your in the unit that you've proposed, and the surface owner at that location says, over my dead body, are you gonna set a foot on my land? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> then it seems as though there's no project to be had. Mm -hmm. um, and so it seems it seems like getting that um, consent or buy-in from the landowners who are going to be impacted by the remediation um, is more than, it, it, it's not like these other things that you can kind of line up after the unit has been established. I, I kind of disagree. I think uh, I think that Are you, you just that charming that you're going to be able to convince <laughs> them that you're to. <laughs> uh, uh, no. <laughs> so I'll answer that with a yes or no. Uh, uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I believe that there's many ways to do this right. Um, and my the way that I think about it is you want to have uh, the people be in the know and you want to get them in the discussions. The reality is that um, with, with the probabilities, it's, it's, it's like, um, I guess, let, let me put it this way. The, the probabilities that we believe that you'd need to get on top of that well are very remote. And so remote to the point that um, many are wells that are getting, many are wells that are getting drilled in the DJ, uh, don't don't come up with any of this, even though you know the possibility of them needing to to do this would be the case as well, uh, because they're going through verticals. So let me. I want to make sure that I am not misunderstanding, because I thought based on our previous conversation that, regardless of whether um, the low probability, high impact event that we hope doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. Let's say you're totally right. It's 100% safe. Nothing mm -hmm. out of the ordinary happens. Mm -hmm. You're still going to need people there while you're conducting the work, right? That's Me that's the that's the trespass that I'm not, wow. you know, that's the um, incursion onto the surface owner's property that I'm uh, concerned about is like nothing goes wrong, everything goes right, but you still need to have some people there and you still need to have an, an access agreement with those surface owners. I, I actually don't think that's the case. Uh, well, don't look at her. <laughs> I'm just, uh, what was that? Yeah, it's. I guess where I, where I go to is this well. Um, the wells. There's a lot of uh, vertical wells underneath uh, subdivisions that I don't think uh, the operators uh, go to each one in particular. Is if it's properly remediated and say, hey, you know, this is happening. I think uh, operations go um, just um, are done in a safe manner knowing what what needs to be done so so let me let me i guess let me let me let me step it back and say i i think that getting the owner's consent is critical to making it be done the right way so i would i would agree with that and so your your point if i may talk through through what what, what you what i'm hearing you say commissioner Roberto, is that um you see that as uh, a key to the project being developed because if they don't, if they don't uh, give us uh, access, then uh, there's no there's no way to get to it. There's no there's no there's no project. I think there's ways. I mean, it's it's in the backyard. Um, you could you could you could talk into into that direction. I think that's a po that's a probability. Yeah. I... Okay, that's all. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Luis. So appreciate your patience and sticking around for a bit longer. Uh, a couple of questions uh, on that 30% that Commissioner Ager talked about. Ballpark, so we'll speculate about how many wells would that amount to? I think it's uh, close to 300 wells, approximately 300 wells. And that does give you full information on the well costs, the completion costs, yeah. all your operating expenses, everything. Since yes. you're participating in that. 
What's the royalty interest on the state section? Um, 20, 17, 19, 21. 21%. So, no, I mean, sort of a ballpark, remember, it's 21% on this uh, base number five, 55, where your rate of return is 27%. Notion you could add 21% to that to sort of say if you own 100% of the minerals that'd be fairly close because you're going to get another 20 plus percent rate of return. I didn't follow the line of thought, I'm sorry. Say okay. that one more time. So if you look at the table where they show you as a 27% rate of return. Yes. Basically another 21% of that rate of return is going to the state because the state does not have a cost bearing share. Yes. Okay. Lastly, there's I believe there's 12 vertical wells in section 36. Yes. So what about the other 10? Have they been properly plugged? Are they operating? They, so, I mean, when you look at your, your diagram, the horizontal wells go right next door to these. Yeah. The, um, the, the wells have been either uh, uh, properly remediated from its origin and or uh, remediated uh, recently. So one, one of the wells actually got recently remediated. Have so, you talked to state, the OGCC, about all 12? And yes. Gotten a buy-in from them that they're all covered except these two? Yes. And so again, this is again a bit of speculation about risk or concern when those wells are completed. You're comfortable that that's low risk based on that those wells have been remediated properly? I think the, the remediation of those wells is critical to being able to do uh, safe uh, drilling. Just those two, but I'm talking yes. about the other two. Oh, yes, yes. Okay. All right. uh, as far as essentially directional, directionally going into P&A of those wells, is that technology would be similar to what the industry's had to use to manage uh, blowouts on new wells, where they've had to drill relief wells from an angle? Yes. So this is established technology? Yes. Okay. Thank you. No more questions. Thank you. Yes. I follow up on one of yours. Yes, Commissioner Anger. You you, um, you said one of these vertical wells had been recently remediated. Yes. Was it in the neighborhood? No, it was actually the one um, furthest northwest. Okay. Okay. Commissioner Holton, do you have any questions? Yes. Um, how new is this development? Two thousand and one. And so they allowed them to build houses that close over a P and A well. Um. <laughs> yes, Mr. Holton, I, I'm not sure that you know Riza has any availability to answer that question as it's not a real estate developer to develop these in 2001. No, I'm not blaming Riza, I'm, but from a land use standpoint, I can't believe that they'd let them build houses over the top of the P and A well. That's ridiculous. It wouldn't happen in Fort Lupton. <laughs> so, do you know the mayor of Lock Bowie? <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> conversation? Maybe you yes, need to have I a do. conversation with him. I mean, uh, in well, I would I would encourage Risa to to contact Lock Bowie and maybe look at the development plans and everything else just to make sure that you've got all your bases covered if this thing does go forward. Absolutely, Commissioner Holton. All right. Any other questions or comments, Commissioner Holton? Nope, I'm done. All right. Any other commissioners? Uh, yeah. I would suggest before your next witness that we take a 10 minute yeah. break. <laughs> <laughs> would that be okay to the other commissioners? All right. Thank you. We've been here for almost two hours. <laughs>
Ms. Jost. We have no further witnesses. Awesome. <laughs> um, I would like to know the time, please. Ms. Prine, what time do we have? Risa has 15 minutes, 13 seconds. Um, Kerr McGee has 40 minutes, 30 seconds. Thank you. Mr. Parrott. Actually, can we steal a microphone too? Oh. As long as you give it back. <laughs> Thank you, commissioners. Uh, my name is Evan Beckett. I'll represent Kerr McGee. Um, First up today, we have Bill Gonzalez. So Bill, please introduce yourself and state your position with KMG. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Bill Gonzalez. I am the mineral land long-term planning supervisor for Kermagee. Um, I've been with Kermagee for nine years. Prior to that, I had, um, received BS in economics from Texas A&M University and a JD from the University of Texas School of Law. I've worked various positions with Kermagee um, in the Powder River Basin, the DJ Basin, and the Uinta Basin on both the land side and the project management side. Okay, thank you. Um, our first exhibit here today is exhibit L1. This is Bates stamped 151 in your packet. What we're looking at here in KMG exhibit L1 um, in the red box uh, represented, excuse me, in the red dash box represented by the east half of section 26 and the entirety of section 35 represents KMG's proposed DSU. Um, the black dash box you've seen is RISE's proposed DSU as well as the surface locations, laterals, and associated front builds with RISE's um, uh, proposed well bores. Uh, what you see in the shaded blue boxes uh, throughout the map are KMG working interest, leasehold, and or Anadarko land core fee minerals. Okay, thank you. Uh, next exhibit, exhibit L2, please. Would you mind explaining this exhibit? In this exhibit, again, we see KMG's proposed DSU in the blue dashed box. Um, again, uh, well, not again, but also you see the associated well bores with that DSU. These well bores were actually um, attempted to be permitted with the COGCC uh, as well bore spacing units for each of these well bores. They were the on the west side, the Lopka wells, and on the east side, the Byerly wells. We were in the process of securing our NICOs or allowing our NICO notice to expire at the time that we discovered that RISE's permits had been submitted. Um, our development for the DSU would be substantially similar to what you see here. Um, we would have to negotiate some of the wells to accommodate the 460 foot uh, setback boundary within the DSU. Additionally, we have surface use, surface use agreements in both locations um, and these are, these are good to go. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna pause on this exhibit for a second. Did you hear uh, Mr. Harless's and, and Lewis's statement earlier today that alternative surface locations uh, were reviewed for sections 34 and 36? I did. And does it appear that based on the, this map that there could be other locations to review uh, in sections 25, 30, 31, 1, and 6 for RISE's development plan? Yes. Well, I have not uh, been on the ground to see those. Um, looking at the aerial satellite image that we see here, um, it does look like there's substantial opportunities in and around section 36 for the development of section 36. Additionally, I believe that I heard Luis say that they do have an agreement with the state land board for the surface location in the northwest of section 36. Okay, thank you. And then one final question here. Um, Commissioner Overturf made a remark earlier today, whether or not there was a plan to be had. Um, pausing on this exhibit, can you just please provide your opinion to that remark? Uh, yes, I, and as, as it applies to Kerr McGee and the plan we see here, there is a plan to be had. We have both surface locations, um, well board diagrams, we've done vertical um, well uh, prep reviews on any associated vertical wells that were within buffers, um, not just the 1500 foot K COGCC buffers, but within KMG's buffers. Uh, so when you, when you look at a plan to be had, this is what we have here. And we were days away from permitting this um, as well bore spacing, um, and we're ready to uh, put a drilling rig on here, a drilling rig that we have under contract as early as second quarter of next year. Okay, thank you. Next slide. Exhibit L3, this is bait stamped 153. Could you please explain this commission to the, or this uh, slide of commission? Yes. KMG exhibit L3 represents Kerr McGee's um, regional development plan. Um, what you see here are, are several laterals. The dark blue laterals represent producing wells, horizontal wells, or approved permits um, that would be operated by Kerr McGee. In the light blue, you see uh, pending permits that would be operated by Kerr McGee. Um, additionally, in the east half of sections 10, 15, 22, and 27, and the west half of sections 14 and 23, we're in the process of our NICO uh, notices expiring, in which case those would also be permitted by Kerr McGee as part of this overall uh, regional development plan. 
Um, of course, uh, associated with that are the efficiencies gained um, with the wells that we drill in the area. In the dark orange are the um, approved permits or produced horizontal wells that are operated by other operators. And in light orange are those pending permits. And of course, in the center of this map, you see the competing DSUs that are issued today, um, Kerr McGee's DSU in red and RISE's DSU in black, and RISE's um, proposed laterals through sections 35 and 36. And then beyond those uh, uh, APDs that are identified within RISE's DSU, are there any APDs on this map that belong to RISE? No. And are you aware of any uh, APDs uh, belonging to RISE in the entire state of Colorado? In, in fact, I checked yesterday, and as of yesterday, there's not been a single approved APD um, with RISE as the operator. Okay, thank you. That's all I have for uh, direct. Cross-examination. You testified that um, Carmegie submitted APDs for its, for its proposed unit. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. What date was that? I don't remember the exact date, but I believe it was in the first half of June. Those APDs were rejected because RISA had its APDs first. That's correct. RISA's APDs are still pending in its proposed unit, is that correct? As far as I understand. Now, are you familiar with the COGCC regulatory processes? Uh, for Object the most part. Sorry, uh, objection too broad of a statement. Are you familiar uh, with the way APDs are? So it Sustain. <laughs> are you familiar with the way APDs are filed? I am generally familiar with the way APDs are filed. However, that is not uh, not within my realm of of, um, of responsibility at no Kermagee. But do you you do know that when an APD is filed, any member of the public has the right to submit a comment on a Form Two or Form Two A? Are you familiar with that? I actually didn't realize that that was the case. In fact, I believe there was a uh, some certain there were standing issues. Um, at, that would require certain persons to have standing in order to okay. um, protest those. So is that why Kerr McGee didn't file any comments on the location of Rice's proposed wells? I do not know why Kerr McGee did not file um, any objections on the locations of Rice's proposed wells. Okay, so you also don't know why Rice didn't submit any concerns regarding the vertical wells in section 36? No, I do not. Okay, and you do know that Kerr McGee didn't submit any comments regarding mediation of the vertical wells on the um, permits? Asked an answer. No, I asked about the surface of the proposed wells, I asked about the vertical wells, and now I'm asking about the remediation of the vertical wells. I believe that there's, we're parsing it pretty narrowly here, but I'll allow that question. But um, I believe the question was about Kermie's comments on, or, uh, on, on the remediation. Yeah. I do not know or, do, or believe that Kermie submitted comments on that. So do you know whether or not, well, let me rephrase that. Kermit, Kerr McGee did not submit comments at all on any of the APDs filed by Objection, Tyson, it, it asked and answered. That one I would agree, I'll overrule, or sorry, sustain. <laughs> sure. Thank you. So the first time you raised concerns about the vertical wells and about possible um, remediation was at this hearing, is that correct? In well, the filings for this hearing. Uh, in the filings for this hearing were the first time they were raised publicly. However, we Perfect. were just- oh, I meant publicly. Thank you. Um, now, had concerns been raised before, the permitting commission's permitting unit would have reviewed your concerns. Is that correct? I do not know. You don't know. And so you also don't know whether or not the engineering unit reviews concerns that are provided regarding offset well mitigation and remediation. You don't know that either? It's my understanding, the engineering team at the COGCC staff, that they do review the permits. Okay. And so, but you failed to communicate with them about your concerns as well. Objection. This is the third time this question has been asked, and I would ask that the chairman yeah, ask the chairman what? opposing counsel to refrain from asking repetitive no, no. questions. Yeah, can, can perhaps we can move on to a different line of questioning. Sure. Um, are you familiar with who requires um, best, minute, best management practices on an APD? Are you familiar with who on the commission staff does that? Uh, who specifically on the commission yeah. staff? Um, I I do, I'm not entirely familiar, but my guess would be it'd be Mr. Ellsworth. Okay. And it would be Mr. Ellsworth that would also require conditions of approval. Is that correct? That'd be my understanding. And those conditions of approval and best management practices are generally placed on a form two. Is that correct? I believe that's correct. Okay. Thank you. I have no further questions. All right. 
right, Mr. Gonzalez, thank you for your testimony today. Um, with respect to the wells that you have noted, can, and Evan, I'm sorry, can you flip back to your prior exhibit where you showed the wells? No, but I'll use it. Um, so isn't it true that the wells still show as Great Western Byerly or Ritchie Wells on the COGCC's website? I'm sorry, can I have that question one more time? So the wells that you're purporting are Anadarko wells within your unit the, uh, on the COGCC's website, even as of yesterday and this morning, still show as Great Western Byerly and Ritchie Wells, correct? Um, I, I'm not sure if that's the case. Okay, and we're happy to pull up the website if we need to, um, but I can make just an offer of proof that on the website as of today, snapshot in time, the Wells and Kermagee's units are shown as Great Western's Byerly and Great Western's Ritchie Wells. I, I believe to, to piggyback on Ms. Durancy's comment that the, the staff has a lot of work to do and they are oftentimes um, uh, delayed, not delayed, but sometimes the information is, is delayed on getting to the site. But isn't it true that those are not Anadarko wells at this point in time? Uh, they are Anadarko wells. In fact, we've acquired the surface rights and the um, the leasehold rights from Great Western um, and have submitted permits as Kerr McGee. In fact, there are pending permits right now for the Byerly wells uh, that were returned to draft form. But those permits do not show up on the website at this point in time because of RISE's permits, correct? That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Jost, are you speaking to the wells that are in proposed drilling and spacing in unit? In Kermagee's proposed drilling and spacing unit, correct. Okay, Those just for service. Great Western Wells. I think we all have to agree that the commission has an awful lot of work to do. <laughs> we would agree to. <laughs> catching up. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Gonzalez. Okay, any redirect, Mr. Parrott? Just, just short. Um, Mr. Gonzalez, you stated that the filings in this case were the first time that Kermagee publicly raised its concerns about vertical well remediation in Section 36, uh, right? That's correct. Um, had you previously expressed concerns privately about that issue? Uh, yes, Kermagee had, had substantial concerns, and we were trying to figure out what our game plan was going to be in terms of addressing RISE's permits um, and the proposed DSU that we had lots of deliberation about before deciding to move forward with our own DSU um, that is before, before the Commission today. Uh, and um, recall Ms. Joe's questions from just a moment ago about some Great Western permits and Kerr McGee's proposed DSU. Um, yes? Yes, I do okay, recall sorry. the questions. Sorry, just for the public that is uh, listening on the, the online. Um, those, those Great Western permits are expired, correct? I don't know exactly okay. if they are or not. Okay. Um, no more questions. Very well. Commissioners, any questions? Well, we can't let you totally escape, <laughs> Mr. Dolly. <laughs> yeah. I saw them. the wells that you were just referring to, the Great Western, are those the, the ones in 26 that are orange? Is that what you're talking about? No, those sir. Those have been permitted? The ones in 26 on the west side um, that are in orange. I don't recall the operator, but those were permitted some time ago. The pad that is on the east side of Section 26, you'll see the surface location on the northeast of Section 26. Originally, those were permitted by Great Western. When we Once we acquired those lands from Great Western, we moved to re-permit those. In fact, we had to move the surface location to accommodate um, our drilling uh, the pad necessities that we had. Uh, we negotiated an amended SUA with that surface owner and had resubmitted our permits accordingly. Okay, in our uh, base number 153, those on the east side also show up as orange and they show up as one mile laterals. There was a, and so there was a, a an error in the first exhibit that was submitted from my understanding. Uh, we submitted to council a, an updated version of that, so I apologize for the confusion. They should be light blue as represented on the um, screen now. We'll look for that amongst our plethora of information we have on this. All right. Any other questions? Um, would you please define the acronym NICO, please help me? NICO is a um, notice of intent to commence operations. Oh, I couldn't get the C. Thank you very much. <laughs> no other questions? We can move on. Thank Chairman you, Commissioner. A, a quick procedural question. Um, <clears throat> 
based on the time that's left, it seems that uh, RISA may not be intending on presenting rebuttal, but Kermagee does have rebuttal testimony for Mr. Gonzalez to present. So I just want to make sure that it's clear that we would be bringing him back up later and that there wouldn't be any problem with that. I can't see any reason why we wouldn't want <laughs> okay. to bring him back up Thanks. if you have the time. I would just like to clarify that Kermagee doesn't get to decide if we get rebuttal, so we do oh, have rebuttal. We understand. <laughs> we fully understand that, so that's speculation on their part. So we'll leave it at that. Thank you, commissioners. All right, next, um, we're going to ask Mr. Nathan Bennett to come up here. Yeah. And Mr. Bennett, would you please introduce yourself to the commission? Uh, good morning, commissioners. My name is Nathan Bennett. I am currently the planning and execution supervisor for Kermagee's DJ Basin Assets. I have worked for Anadarko Petroleum since 2010. I have a BA from St. Bonaventure University and an MS from Shippensburg University. I also hold a certification of licensed professional geoscientists from the state of Louisiana. I have more than 13 years of experience in the field of petroleum ge uh, geology. Excuse me. During this time, I have personally been involved in mitigating legacy oil and gas wells. Thank you, Mr. Bennett. And are you aware of the stipulation between the parties as it pertains to each DSU's underlying geology here today? Yes, I am. And have you reviewed that stipulation? Yes, I have. And uh, have you also prepared geology exhibits for the subject lands in anticipation of this hearing? Yes. And is it your professional opinion um, that the materials within that stip stipulation are true and accurate? Yes, to the best of my knowledge. And then finally, does KMG here stipulate today that the proper well count for its own DSU is 19 wells? Yes, that is correct. And the, the KMG application asked for up to 30 wells in its, in its DSU, correct? Yes. And can you just briefly explain to the commission why KMG feels now 19 is the appropriate number for its DSU? Certainly. Since we filed our original application, we have continued to undertake our due diligence as it relates to well spacing, uh, economic development, and the efficiency of resource recovery within the proposed uh, application. And as such, we have reduced our well count to 19. Thank you. No further questions. Any cross-examination? No, thank you. I guess you don't get to redirect then. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioners, any questions? Commissioner Holton? I'm good, thank you. You're our best witness so far today. <laughs> <laughs> so far. Uh, next, we're going to ask Dr. David Folder to testify. Uh, Dr. Falder, would you please introduce yourself and, and provide your relationship to KMG? Yes, my name is uh, David Falder. I'm a consulting petroleum engineer at Better. I'm here on behalf of KMG as a consultant. I have a BS in petroleum engineering from the University of Wyoming. I have a master's and doctor degrees from Colorado School of Mines where I'm an adjunct professor. I have over 37 years experience in the industry as a petroleum and geothermal engineer. I worked for Chevron in the past for the Idaho National Engineering Lab for uh, SAIC, Bill Barrett Corporation, Terrigen, and Nighthawk Production in a range of diverse environments. I'm a licensed petroleum engineer in Colorado and California, and a member of the Society of Petroleum Evaluation Engineers. Okay, thank you. Uh, did you listen to the oral testimony today provided by Mr. Cooper? Yes, I did. And uh, did you prepare engineering materials in anticipation of today's hearing, particularly uh, as to drainage, acreage, and radius? Yes, I did. And are those are those uh, provided in KMG's materials, Bates numbers 180 through 185? Yes, they are. And in your professional opinion, would you agree that the engineering testimony today provided by RISA speaks accurately to the drainage acreage and drainage radius for KMG's proposed wells? Uh, yes, I do. So I think in an effort to kind of save time and conserve some brain power here at this point, we'd like to stipulate to RISA's engineering testimony, at least as it pertains to uh, drainage acreage and drainage radius. Uh, and with that, we will jump right into more of an economic analysis at exhibit E5A, which is your Bates number 186. Okay. My apologies. Do you have this for the screen? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. E5A. Keep going. <laughs> there we go. Back up. Here we go. Would you please explain this, this slide to the commission? Yes, this slide is a list of the proposed KMG wells using two drilling pads for a total of 19 wells. This exhibit shows the proposed lateral length, the estimated EUR, and the estimated capital cost. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, next slide. Yes, this is the uh, list of rice of proposed wells using one drilling pad for a total of 16 wells. This well shows the proposed stimulated lateral length, the estimated EUR and well capital costs. These costs are strictly, uh, these drilling costs or capital costs are drilled to drill a typical horizontal well and do not include the cost of an average 5,000 foot front end build, the cost to mitigate sections 36A, or the ancillary cost for a new operator to drill a complex well program. The intent of this was to do a first pass levelized economics to evaluate the relative economic merits of the two proposals. Uh, the cost that was provided by Anna Darko and on, based on other pure play competitors in the basin. The economics assumed that both parties could drill a well every seven days and the wells are drilled, all wells are drilled before the start of completions and uh, all wells were start production at the same time. The well, well, well Texas Intermediate and Henry Hub price were used on August 22nd strips of this year. The oil and price deducts were uh, based on data provided to me, averaged about seven dollars and a quarter for oil and about a dollar six five for the gas operating cost. The I'm sorry, the uh, deducts. The operating cost was about ten and a half dollars per barrel oil equivalent, and these are all based on uh, data provided by me by Anadark or KMG. And these costs look very real to me, and this gives a first pass, very levelized economics. Just look at the economic merits of the two proposals. Okay, and thank you. And having run the economics on each plan, what is your professional opinion as to the economic practicality of each of each DSU? Uh, it's going to be very challenged by capital cost. Uh, the capital cost will probably need to be uh, less than $5 million a well to be economic at a PB10 basis. So in your professional opinion, would you, would you testify here today that Rice's plan is uneconomic? Yes, I would. And you plan to testify further today uh, to these contingencies and to the uneconomic nature of Rice's plan? Yes, I do. Thank you. No further questions. Ms. Jost? No questions at this point in time. Thank you. Very well. Any questions for the commissioners at this point? Commissioner Jolly. Um, Mr. Walter, Ed, is it uneconomic just because of the build out? Uh, there's a number of reasons why it's uneconomic. Uh, the build out is one of them, but also you're looking at the uh, the time value of money, the delay for having two drilling rigs for two pads for the Anadarko proposal and Rice having one rig. You have a delay in your time to you start production. That delay has an impact on the economics, especially the high decline these wells had early on. Of course, the NRI, the Rice proposal, impacts the operator economics. Also, the Rice economics, they use uh, fewer Codell wells than uh, Anadarko or KMG. And the Codell wells are your better wells for economics, so this also impacts the economics. Very well. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much. This concludes our uh, case in chief. Thank you very much. Uh, all right, any 510 statements associated with this? We know of. Ms. Prine, Mr. Roush? I'm not aware of any. All right, very well. Since we answered that question, we can go on to uh, a presentation of staff analysis. <laughs> Sorry you look so thrilled. <laughs> if there is one. I guess it's a request. Is there a staff analysis on this? Uh, just a few comments. Very um, good. One, I think it's important to keep our eye on the ball as to what we're doing here, and that's establishing a drilling and spacing unit. <coughs> uh, they, they have to show that the uh, formations they're going to drill in underlie the unit. That's been done by RAISA and stipulated to by uh, Kerr McGee. Um, the drainage radius and number of acres drained have been stipulated by the parties. Uh, that seems to uh, protect correlative rights, and that leaves us with the economics. And you have one uh, economics witness saying it's economical, they can do it. Uh, you have another one saying they can't do it. Uh, and I think it's going to be up to you to see which one you believe. But at this point in time, I would tend to... Uh, I'm down on the side of RISA. They filed the first application and they've shown through their testimony that uh, 
all of the elements needed to establish a drilling and spacing unit. Uh, while this anti-collision stuff and well remediation is fascinating, that is something that is usually left to the engineering staff and the operator to work out. Um, you know, with any given well, you can think of a worst case scenario where the price of the well goes out of control. I mean, any given well, I suppose, could blow out and burn up half the county and be uneconomic. But, uh, you know, I think uh, the type of evidence you've heard from RISE is the type you've used in the past to approve drilling and spacing units. Commissioners, any questions for Mr. Rush? Mr. Jolly. Um, yes, Mr. Rouse, I, maybe I've missed something here today, but um, if, what about the potential if we, if, um, if we uh, do not go with RISE's um, plan, what about the potent, is there a potential of stranding the whole section of uh, section 36? Because of those Unmitigated well, I wish Mr. Wells. Ellsworth was here, but um, I think that that is a possibility. You know, I mean, we've long established that two mile laterals are, are the way to go, if at all possible, and the Rise of Plan does that. And I'm not seeing a whole lot of uh, options for reaching the Rise of Acreage in Section 36. Um, and it would require apparently one mile laterals if you look at all the wells surrounding it that are proposed or permitted. This may not be fair to ask you this question, but is there a way to get to those minerals in 26, or excuse me, 36, that don't, uh, that, that self-mitigate the, put those vertical wells? So I'm not sure I understand the well, question or I'm qualified uh, it, to answer it, but. Uh, I, I was hoping maybe, um, McGee and I should ask the question when they had their uh, uh, back. legacy well mitigation specialist. I mean, how, how can can the uh, minerals be safely drilled in 36 from a different direction? I guess is a question. We can certainly have uh, Mr. Bennett answer that okay. for you, Commissioner John. I'd answer your question, sir. In my opinion, there are a number of ways that the minerals beneath Section 36 could potentially be developed by RISA. Uh, one of those efforts has been mentioned earlier, that is finding an alternative surface location that would allow them to drill one mile laterals in 36 and realize their mineral potential. Another potential uh, offer or opportunity, excuse me, would be to employ some of the technology we used in past iterations of the Wattenberg field, specifically deviated or directional wells setting up, for example, in the northwest quarter of Section 36 and deviating those wells to avoid where we believe the legacy wells are in 36 and still produce minerals from both the Niobrara and the Codel. I will, I will add to that last suggestion that it would take a unique and out-of-the-box idea. Um, with those directional or deviated wells, it does seem like uh, RISA has that uh, temperature for doing things outside the box, and so I would encourage them to look at that potential and develop a series of directional wells uh, from the northwest quarter of 36 to capture their minerals in 36. Mr. Jolly, would we be able to answer your question as well? Please. Thank you. Would you like to address? Uh, do you mind restating the question just to make sure I'm, because I got lost in. Well, it, it would seem that you're kind of stuck with a, um, a, a surface location that might not be ideal to reach section 36. Is there another way to get to section 36 that might not be quite as risky? Well, high impact, uh, low risk. Uh, uh, I, 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 I'd say that the way that we see it is, the way that we're proposing is actually the most efficient way. Um, oh. If we're having to drill from 36, uh, the inefficiencies of a one mile lateral, and actually it will have it will actually have spillover effects to where there will be more one mile laterals because it's not just we're having to do one mile, one mile laterals and Adalco is having to do one mile laterals as well. Um, and so from our standpoint, it would make it to where um, it would have a, it would have a economic impact on us to, uh, if we're able to do it, thank you. Um, 
Nathan. Uh, for, for your um, endorsement. Uh, um, if we were able to do it, it would have uh, a negative repercussion with respect to how we can do it from 35, 36, and it would have a spillover effects on the west half of section one on the south 66, and it would have negative repercussions on the north of the DSU that they have, because as you can see, uh, they're, they're proposing two mile lateral south, one mile laterals on the west half of 35, and then one mile laterals going north on 23. And so if, if I count, basically the way that I see it is, let's kind of figure out how many two mile laterals, how many sections are being drilled with two mile laterals and how many sections are being drilled with one mile laterals. The way that we're proposing it, three sections worth are being drilled with two mile laterals, um, half a section's worth is being drilled with one mile laterals. The way that Clemagee is proposing it is, two, two sections worth are being drilled with two mile laterals and another uh, section and half's worth is being drilled with one mile laterals. So, yeah. The, yeah, I mean, the, the point is, so said, said more succinctly and bottom lining it, people ask me to bottom line. Uh, section, <laughs> section 36 needs to be mitigated regardless, and for us, it makes more economic sense having 35 and 36 than doing on a one mile lateral on 36. Mr. Jolly, we got a little far afield from your question about access to section 36. May Mr. Bennett address the two mile, one mile lateral issue that Mr. Sure. Rodriguez brought up. Thank you. So if I understand what, what Lewis just uh, mentioned in terms of section 36 and section one, I believe what he described uh, is exactly what Kerr, Kerr McGee is, is proposing in our application, but kind of the inverse mirror image. If I, again, if I understand correctly, uh, what Lewis described, that is a mix of two mile, one mile, mile laterals in a DSU that would encompass the western half of section one and all of section 36, which is very similar, again, to what Kerr McGee is proposing to the west and north, respectively. Yep, that's, that's, that's right. And so, and the, and the only reason to me that it works from the standpoint of Kerr McGee is that if you look at where all those one miles for Kerr McGee end up, is where their minerals are at. And so, yeah, that's, a, that's a, an advantage that we don't have, that we haven't, we're having to overcome. So uh, yes, I, I agree with you. Thank you. Commissioner Ager. Okay, I have a couple of questions. And um, for Kerr McGee, um, I'm not sure it might be for Dr. Falter. Um, but my question would be, does Anna Darko agree that regard, if, you if you take out the equation, the well mitigate, the mitigating, or the wells that have to be remediated, the old verticals, is a two mile lateral more efficient than a one mile lateral to drain these reservo the reservoir we're trying to, these two reservoirs? Thank you, you asked my question. Yes, Commissioner. As far as drainage, the way we're doing the calculation, we're assuming that a, that a lateral length will uh, cover so much res uh, oil reserves, so it's independent of how long it is, where the length of the well bore gets into is the capital cost associated to drain those minerals. So is it more economic to drill a two mile lateral than a one mile lateral? Uh, perhaps it may be, depends on the operator. You know, I, it depends on the operator's experience, but yes. Okay, and then can you repeat, Pete, earlier, um, I think uh, Commissioner Jolly asked you why you didn't think it was economic, and I heard the remediation of the wells um, and, and the, the front builds, but you listed a few other okay. issues. Uh, another issue is that with the, the one pad versus two pad drilling proposals, the race of wells will take longer to drill and complete to bring on production, even if all both uh, companies were doing the same time to drill and complete a well, just that the one well, one rig versus two rigs, two pads, one pad, makes the race of wells longer to come on production. And that delay in time impacts the economics because these wells have very high initial declines. So when you put that cash flow back in time more, it impacts the discounting and the value of that well forward in time. So that impacts the uh, value of the wells with that just that delay in getting the wells back on production. And the other thing is that the race proposal uses fewer Codell wells than Niobrara wells, and the Codell are the better economic performing wells. So it drops the economics on an overall basis that way too, mm. as, as a portfolio per, per, uh, perspective. Okay, um, would Raisa agree with that statement about Codell versus? So, a few things. 
Uh, one, you're, you're right. Um, the Kermagi proposal has two surfaces, and we have one. And so I think your point is that, um, what, as I understood it is, well, you can drill one and put it into production whilst you're drilling the other one. But in our proposal, you're only having one surface to deal with. And so, yeah, that's, that's you know, you can play with those games. I think overall it doesn't, you know, that's kind of not, not material. Then on the Codel piece, um, I think that our, our, our standpoint is that, um, and, and this is within the margins because actually when you look at how Anadarko does it, they don't put six codels usually, they put four. And the reason is it drains a substantial more, bigger area than the Niobrera. And the only time I've seen you guys put codels uh, to that density that you're describing is two miles northeast and it was a complete disaster. It's called the Bat, the Banes, and the English Farms. Okay. Thanks. We were in them. Um, and okay. Um, I have a question for the staff and director. I think you're going to tell me you want Mr. Ellsworth here, but I'm going to give it a shot anyway. Um, I'm wondering if you can put into perspective um, the potential usefulness versus uh, of plugging those, appropriately plugging those vertical wells versus avoiding them for potential safety hazards. Your first instinct is right. <laughs> and that Where's Mr. Be... Berger? Is he still hiding out back there? Somewhere? Yeah, let me check to see if Craig Berger has any thoughts. That's a great suggestion. Um, okay, I'll wait. Um, maybe someone else has some questions before. Mr. Chair, that's my only question. So if we need to move on and wait for that I'm answer. I'm thinking that's it has been suggested that perhaps we could uh, go through some other portions of this because we still have a uh, rebuttal to go through and some other items. And maybe we get through that. We have rebuttal, uh, sort of see if we get some of our questions answered along the way because I have a half dozen or so. And I'm, so I'll withhold those until we get to the end and we get through just before we close. Uh, the record as the last of our questions. So next on the item is the rebuttal by Risa. Yes, thank you. We have a short rebuttal from Mr. Luis Rodriguez as well as Casey Harless. Um, so Luis, since you're up here, I'm just gonna go ahead and <laughs> ask you your questions. Um, what I would first like you to do is go back to exhibit O, which is our Bates number 55. Jill, can you get us there on the screen if you don't mind? Um, Commissioner Bitten had asked you a question earlier about an explanation, I believe it was Commissioner Bitten, of the difference between the percentages on here. Can you just clarify um, your analysis of the pre-hearing statement by Kermagee's pre-hearing statement table and what you were utilizing that for to um, basically confer that our economics do support the application? Yes. So. The reason we were back on this is because um, our team heard it slightly different. Um, but I'll try to make it clear as to what the point was. They have, Kermagee has 51% as a return, and we have 27.13 as our return. And I guess the, the point that we were trying to make is that the reason that there's that difference is because instead of the uh, state minerals uh, income coming to us, it's going to the state. and so. If you were to have the state mineral incomes come to us, those numbers would be quite similar. And so I, I think that's what the point was. But basically, actually, yeah, you get a 49% rate of return if you yes. have the state minerals. Mm -hmm. Yes, if you were to put that in there, exactly. And that's that's the only difference between the two: the fact that we don't we're paying we're paying the state. And just for purposes of clarification, um, when you had talked about your communications with the. Um, COGCC technical engineering staff. Who did you communicate with at the state? 
we we communicated with uh, Eric Jacobson and Diana Byrne. And um, it was Diana Byrne who confirmed the remediation for purposes of the two vertical wells, correct? Meaning, meaning Diana Byrne was the one who stated the um, type of remediation that Objection, could occur to rise hearsay. Up, I, I, yes. I mean, I can rephrase it, but this is also a conversation with the state that um, RISA has had. And so, if RISA had wanted Ms. Byrne's evidence to be here, it could have asked her to come to the hearing. And under the best evidence rule, Mr. Rodriguez is not allowed to testify about things that Ms. Byrne said. Well, I have a copy of an email that came late on Friday that we could send that as an exhibit, but we didn't want to go down that route of fighting over exhibits. So, I mean, I'm happy to move on from this, but all I was doing was clarifying that there was a communication and a lot of communication with Diana Byrne and Eric Jacobson from the state. Objection. Council is now testifying. Wells. If we could maybe just perhaps move on. I think this has already been fully covered. We were, yeah, that's fine. We can yeah. move on. But we Let's were trying move to on. clarify I'll, for purposes I'll, of rebuttal. Yeah, I'll sustain that. I think it's... You asked the question and it was stated that you had that conversation. I think as commissioners, we understand you've had that discussion. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, so very short rebuttal by Casey Harless. Thank you. And you heard um, Commissioner Overturf's question. 